what's the difference or, you know, for me, I guess I stand here today um, damaged. But first and foremost, what I want to know from you being who you are um, is a short introduction of who is Shane Bugby from your own Oof. mouth, from the horse's mouth. That's a hard one. That's always when that question's asked, it's always like such a hard question. Cause it's like, I lost myself 20 years ago. I'm not even a person anymore. I'm someone that you, you, you all project stuff onto. Uh -huh. And as an artist or a person like that, you cease to exist. The person okay. seems to exist. So, so who gets to see the real me is the person who's going to tickle my nipples or something, you know, that's, I, I, you know, I mean, that's like, and that's a, you know, it's a rare occasion that I can even let my guard down for stuff like that. Because mm -hmm. when you do stuff publicly and controversial and all those things, they offer up pitfalls, you know, it offers up pitfalls. So how long have you been doing art in some, form? it's hard that, my whole life, my whole life is, you know, so it's hard to explain myself like that, you know, it's hard to explain. What do I do? In a subject, I would say I'm like an outlaw publisher or an outlaw self entrepreneur in a capitalist society. But I'm just, I think to explain it honestly, in 50, you know, old man looking back on it, I'm a person who thinks different and artwork's mandatory for me to be able to communicate myself. Because when I use words or facial expressions and stuff like that, a lot of times it's uh, mimicked from other people. Mm -hmm. So the only way to get the truth out of me is through artwork or myself out of me is through artwork. And it's like, you know, I'm told I'm on the spectrum or I have ADHD, all these things. And those, those things, when they give it to you, people are like, you know, they, that's a problem for society, not me. Like, that just means I, I don't fit into your jobs. Mm -hmm. That's okay with me. Like, <laughs> I, I have to tell you, I'm pretty happy about not fitting in with this fucking failing system. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't bother me. It's not like I have a hard time communicating or anything. I just communicate differently. And because of that, because of that, and because of whatever it is inside me that um, rebels or does what he wants, I do what I want, mm -hmm. even to my, to my peril. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think a lot of people do that. And they, then they see someone who communicates differently in a... Um, I don't want to say special way, but a uh, eccentric way, let's say eccentric mm -hmm. or out, outcast way, or they don't, they're not, they're not us. They're different. Yeah. You have, well, I see it as it's your own language of communicating who you are. And I guess your own language would be through your art and what you put you ask, out there. Yeah, yeah. You ask who I am and I, I get treated differently. I'm a poor person and I'm not allowed to be a publisher or an artist. So I get treated differently from the establishment. Mm -hmm. And then poor people treat me differently because I'm, I'm an artist and I'm not, I'm doing, doing stuff that they aren't, uh, you know, don't have the privilege mm -hmm. or the mind to, to be able to feel safe enough to express themselves or be a creative. They're just paying mm -hmm. their bills 24 seven. And gotcha. so, like I said, I just sort of cease to exist. And I am what you put onto me. I am what you project onto me usually. But other than that, I like flannel sheets. Um, <laughs> I like, I like, uh, I forget the name. Ah, uh, oh, damn. Su su succulents. Succulents. Okay. Succulent okay. Plant. I'm horrible. I don't have, I tried, I tried the plants in my apartment just to freshen up the air and it, I was, it was bad news for me. But I you can't. got the doggy. I got the doggy. Yeah. You got the, my baby. My doggy didn't get to come with me. So I had to get the plants. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, all right. So Shane Bugby, I'm going to, I'm going to let you know how I found you because I'm, let's, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm enamored at the fact that you took the opportunity to even talk to me because um, I've been a fan of yours for a couple of years. I found you through Etsy at the time I was heavy into pin collecting and you were part of that pin world. Um, yeah. And you were putting out some really fucking, you know, some interesting stuff, whether it be the, you know, um the kill your idols of uh, of jesus or it'd be the upside down uh darth vader pin um 
the Ed Gain fan club. Uh, you put out the pin in the patch. You did something for the Goonies at one point. So that's how I know you're, that's how I know you. And then through there, I was like, I wonder who this guy is. And then I started doing more research on you. And this is where we found, I found the commonality um, through serial killers. Cause I was, my dad's a cop. He was an ex cop. And growing up, we would watch a lot of like America's most wanted and all that shit. So I grew up, I'm a weirdo myself. I grew up in middle school at the library instead of, you know, doing what the kids are doing. I'm reading up about serial killers and watching porn at the, at the public library while going to Catholic school. Same, so, same, same boy. We had a similar life there. So this is why like I am enamored <clears throat> at the fact that you took this opportunity because you put out some really fucking amazing art. So I wanted to know like in the nineties, what, what made you feel the need to want to communicate through art? Like, was it like just something that you found, you know, just to pass the time and you enjoyed it or you felt like there was really something you wanted to say? Oh, there's never been a time where it's been out of boredom or to pass the time. It's not a, it's not a hobby to me. It's not mm -hmm. anything but the way for me to understand the world and myself. Mm -hmm. And I mean that, like I, I, I dropped out of school the day I turned 16 years old. The day I could legally drop out, it was, it could, I could not figure it out, but I could figure out going to people I was interested in and doing interviews with them. I could figure out how to do a zine, you know, and, and put it out there. So, you know, when I was back, young back then who, who, who started, it was Frank Zappa, like Frank Zappa did this PMRC thing. He started talking about censorship and I did, I want to do a magazine about censorship because I wanted to learn about it. I wanted to understand what it was. And, and so I thought I knew, cause I watched the PMRC hearings with Frank Zappa and he says, you know, People are saying art makes them crazy. And he says that couldn't be true that, you know, a person's just crazy. And if it weren't the artwork that were to make them crazy, it would be the color of your tie or, you know, a mud puddle or something like that, because they have something wrong with them. That's mm -hmm. the issue. It's not the art that triggers it. It's the mental illness that triggers it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, I agree on that. Yeah. He started doing this. He was doing this anti-censorship thing. And it just interested me, the idea of expression, like, I was blown away. I don't know, maybe 14, 13 years old, then 12. I don't know how old I was, but it was like, what in the fuck is this concept about free speech? How, where did someone give it to me? I already have it. Mm -hmm. Like, that's like the dumbass kid. I am I'm like, uh, I could swear I'm talking right now. Dummy. Like I'm talking to the TV like that. Like maybe Frank Zappa, like, Oh yeah. Free speech. You hear me talking. Can you hear me? You know? And I couldn't understand how someone gave me that. I was like, I born a, I was born with the mouth and a fucking vocal cords, like the science of it. Everything blew my mind from for this free speech of it. It all just mm -hmm. blew my mind that someone was bold enough to say they gave me the rights to speak. Mm -hmm. And after that, it was like all bets were off. And then, you know, as a young kid, I could look back or whatever. I could also see like a lot of this. That was that was my naivete, my innocent moment. I wanted to go in and explore expression. But then as I grew older. And I saw how this system was and how it was treating poor people differently than other people. I got really angry. And then I took on the, the boomer's rage, my father's rage about unions being busted. You ever want a job, kid? You better fucking repair robots. They're taking all of our jobs. The phones now say press two for Spanish, one for English. We're fucked here. Mm -hmm. this, is, no, this is what I'm hearing from my the adults so you're hearing that yeah. and that rage is being embedded in you and so when i'm when i'm you know older I, I i started putting out shit for revenge i wanted the fucking world to burn i wanted you know i wanted i want i wanted to express my anger my anger at seeing like you know people pull their teeth with fucking pliers mm -hmm. in my zip code on the regular that's fucked up that's people talk about we're going to slide into barbarism Come over to this zip code. I'll show you some barbaric shit, yo. Mm. Like it's fucked up. And so, yeah, I wanted I wanted to put out stuff to make people hear it, hear the pains of poor people, hear our cries, hear our anger. You know, I I I want to hurt your feelings like you're hurting mine. You know, and that's what it came down to in the '90s. And we we came up with an art movement. Some call it like our our artistic uh, uh, aesthetic terrorism movement. Mm -hmm. and, and it basically like we saw the hippies and I worked with a lot of hippies guys from the sixties, you know, and they're about my age now. And they're trying to tell me the world what's going on. I'm like, you know, fuck you guys, you know, peace and love didn't work for us. You know, uh, we're about hate and violence. You know, when John Lennon was killed, 
my generation was like three down, one to go. Or th- one down, three to go. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. One down, three to go. So we were angry at all that peaceful stuff because it got us nowhere. Mm-hmm. We felt like we're still fucked. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, then enter Satan. So, in, 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 and we'll get to that. I definitely want to cover that. But when we, what I'm, in, it's because it's, again, the internet nowadays, everything is so readily available. In the 90s, obviously, before the internet really hit, I feel like, and this is just coming from my own, you know, perspective. If you, I feel like you really, how did you feel like you hit a dent in the art, underground art world, especially, I'm assuming this is, you were in Chicago? At mm-hmm. that time, because I remember you, you said you uh, in one of the interviews I was listening to, you were living in Portland at that time where you had mm-hmm. just moved out of Portland. But you're originally from Chicago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a okay. Chicago. Okay. Well, I was so born in Lubbock, Chicago. Texas, but I was raised okay. in Chicago. So like, all right, so Chicago in the 90s, no Internet. You're in you're doing your thing with your within your underground art community. How did you make noise in what is what? Some could say is a vast world of just. We followed our forefathers' lead, so we went. I did what the hippies did. You know, we we started up something. You know, we did things satire. Set. We can't. You can't fight this system with violence. Mm-hmm. If you think you can fight our government with guns or anything like that, you're a fool. Mm-hmm. You're a straight up fucking fool. It, it's satire. It's 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 stuff like that that you win. And so, how did we get a voice? We we look to controversy basically a lot of controversy but we you know it was about crafting the right press release it was just about for me the way i originally think it was for me to watch what other people did and how they did it so i'd go i hung out at playboy headquarters and i sat in the lobby and they're like are you here to see someone i'm like yeah i'm waiting for an appointment but i just sat there and watched mm-hmm. and watched how they did things and i'd watch and and so it was about sending press releases out it was about press press Press, uh, press releases, sending them out to n- newspapers, getting to do stories. And at that time, just like the hippies were lucky, the hippies and the Black Panthers and the Church of Satan, we, we were all, they were all lucky in the 60s because they TV was popping and they needed content. So they're platforming, as the kids say now, everyone. Uh-huh. And then at some point, they're like, wait, we shouldn't have put the Black Panthers on here or the Satanists or the hippies. Get them. No more of that. We could have control TV. Then the Internet came along. And we once again had platforms. <laughs> I wonder who, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of the poet Al- Allen Ginsberg. Yeah. I wonder how he would feel today when it comes to censorship. Cause I know he as well at one point would go on and speak with uh, TV personnels when it comes to censorship. I wonder how he would feel. Cause a lot of people, cause I grew up in watching a lot of comedy. So co- I, when it comes to being offended, you can't offend a spick that, you know, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm I'm more, I'm just, I like the shock value of things. So like, I'm, I'm always interested in seeing like how people who Frank Zappa, for example, how would they would feel that when it comes to, I guess, political ideology, some will say that censorship has went from one side to the other spectrum now. Hmm. And the people that used to fight for freedom of speech or anti-censorship are now sort of for it. No, I think, I think. I get what you're saying. I don't think, I think like Allen Ginsberg and, and, and Frank Zappa, even myself, we have a, a, a really heavy view. We have a, he- I know what they would, I know what, how they saw things because they were my teachers mm-hmm. and I've hung, I've hung out with Allen Ginsberg once, but that's another story. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so these were my teachers. And I think when I hear the free speech concepts right now, it's just a lot, it, it's a lot of fear and we have a new tool called the internet. So people are trying to understand how do we rewrite laws? How do we write our system? How do we offer universal income because trucks can now drive beer around the country? I mean, robot trucks. So it's Mm -hmm. like, we really have a whole different era we're entering into. So free speech does need to be discussed. And I think it, uh, first of all, like, um, how would Allen Ginsberg or someone say, I would think that the idea, I think a lot of people, um, when they get emotional, you don't really look at the mathematics of it. Mm-hmm. But to anyone who's thinking that, you've never had so much free speech in your fucking life, in the fucking history of the world, in the history of anything. We've never had so much free fucking speech. 
We've never voted so much in our life. We vote 13 times a day by hitting like buttons and the algorithms see that. And the big Trump is seeing that when he's in with the president, when he's doing their sitting office, they're looking and they're seeing the algorithms as you hit likes and as you don't like. So he says something, he's like, oh, they didn't like that. Let me change it. Mm-hmm. So it's like, ugh, I don't know where I'm going with this. Mm-hmm. What the fuck are we talking about? Once I start talking about that president, so, oh, free speech. Yeah. So it's like <laughs> the idea is that everything's morphing back in the day when it was, you know, a, a guy in a bar could say whatever the fuck he wants is different than that same guy with 10,000 followers on Twitter. It becomes a different kind of thing. And it does. And when in free speech isn't called action, um, when you say go hurt people, that's not free speech. People confuse what free speech is and free speech. Isn't a lot of people like that are against the free speech thing. I think a lot of them, one of the young kids, I go, well, what's your, what's the change? How are you going to change this idea? Cause you know, When you change, you know, free speech is just a real small part of the idea of free expression and the free expression movement. Free speech is a branch that comes off of that. But the the trans community exists and depends on free speech and free expression. If that goes away, they go away. Mm -hmm. So when you take Nazi rhetoric away with free, you know, you start rewriting free speech. You're also doing that to the other side. You're doing it to everyone. It's a blanket Mm -hmm. thing. And I think. A lot of people think free speech is a one sided thing, like you have to listen to it. Mm -hmm. Berkeley understands what free speech is. The Nazis come to the Berkeley school to talk and Berkeley fills the streets with so many people around there that you can't hear them talk. They're louder. Mm -hmm. That that was free speech and the louder speech one. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't. I don't see people communicating that they're that Dave Chappelle said something that hurt their feelings as a bad thing. I think it's Dave Chappelle has an issue like a God like complex that people are talking to him. He's like, Hey, what the fuck? I'm on a stage. You don't talk to me. I'm a King. I'm six feet above you with a microphone, bitch. You don't have no mic. You ain't on a stage. You bought a ticket. Shut the fuck up. And I think that's his attitude, except like, you know, and I get that too, but it's like, as an artist, I'm an artist too. I I could see Chappelle as an artist. And when people start coming at me, I have a decision to, let them choke on it like shut my mouth and let them be upset. Mm-hmm. Or I have a, I have the idea I looking around the, at the political landscape, seeing how many people are hurting right now and how things are being torn apart. And I, I deal with it in a different way. So let's sit and have a conversation. Let's, let's do a special, let's do a Dave Chappelle special. And I want you guys to do jokes about me now. See, that's what I would have did. I want you to come in here and go so hard on me that I fucking crawl under a chair. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to sit in an audience of one, me, Dave Chappelle in the middle of the audience. Go best trans comedians in the world. Come on in and tear me mm-hmm. to fucking shreds. Let's have it. Let's have this. Let's go. But he didn't take the opportunity and do anything with it. He ran mm-hmm. and he said how they were wrong. They weren't wrong. And he wasn't wrong. They were just trying to figure out where we're going. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm a firm believer that uh, I guess this is just based on my experience growing up that um, cause my, I, I kid went in the house, I was in the household where they tried keeping a lot of things away from me, but stupidly at the same time, um, they weren't thinking like, for example, my parents really, anything with parental advisory, especially for my mom, I wasn't allowed to have, but at the same time they put, they allowed me to have cable TV and I have HBO in my room. And instead of being in bed by nine o'clock, I'm fucking watching real sex at 11 learning about something, you know, so, but that's the reality of it. There, that's the reality of it. What you just said is like, it's a ridiculous concept. Like, Oh, I get, I think what you're getting at is that if you censor something, you make it uh, more of a bait, a lure. People want it. What is that? You you said, I can't look at it. Well, I'm going to look at that. I think um, to a certain extent, but this is where you have to look at the the psychology of a child is like you, they, they should be exposed to some things, but what age do, should it be? that they could kind of understand the nature of it while not traumatizing them in some form. But I'm now, as I get older, I realize you can't change the fucking world at a, as a whole. You can only change yourself. Yeah. And then as you change yourself, you, you work on trying to work on your community as well. When I look at that problem, when you say that it's like, what age do we, we, we show a kid something? Well, I would say we, we let them see every fucking thing they want as, as early as possible until we can get our system straight where we can have a parent sit at home and actually raise a child. Cause mm-hmm. it's like ridiculous. Parents don't have time to raise a kid. What the fuck do we expect? 
And like that, like that conversation with that young kid that, that we talked about earlier, where we are talking about like talking to a 19 year old. I'm like thinking in my head, aren't you motherfuckers into porn at like eight years old now? Mm -hmm. like, like kids are like, that's what at least right here on the internet. Like kids are like, I think uh, some famous singer came on. She was, I was watching porn at nine years old. It destroyed me. You know, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I forget the famous female singer, young singer, but she just came mm -hmm. out and said something about it. So it's just sort of funny. Like, like you said, the obscenity was a big deal back in my day. I made money off of obscenity and now I'm mm -hmm. out of business with that business. <laughs> so, so then, yeah. So, uh, if people really haven't done research on you and what you've done in the nineties, I'm just going to give some ideas real quick. Uh, so one of my, the ones that I tell people is the Ed Gain headstone. Yeah. And, um, because again, I grew up studying on um, serial killers. I, I got to know personally how the fuck that happened and what got you into doing that such because that's such an awesome stunt like i'm a punk i grew up a punk so shit like that is just like fuck yeah let's let's have some fun <laughs> well you know as much as i i, I don't know how you know <laughs> legally what can you say it's, it's, yeah, right that's what the statute of limitation is ultimately, <laughs> ultimately i want my fucking stone back and i want to drive <laughs> up the playing field and say give me the stone that i once took out of your cemetery because of good because uh you know it's just one of those things, again, I, you know, searching the world for, you know, searching for occult knowledge and, you know, want to learn about serial killers. I want to hear about their, I want to see where they come from, their environment. I want to see their neighborhood, their zip code. And basically, you know, older, I can tell you, I'm basically trying to learn about myself and how I became the person I did, why my parents became, you know, so I'm looking around the world trying to figure out these things. <clears throat> and um, Plainfield is a creepy place. You know, it's a creepy place. Uh, but going up there, it was weird because there's people goths going up there just to see Ed Gein's tombstone. And then there's a little old lady. So I was like, Oh fuck it. We can snag this fucking thing out of here. And <laughs> no one's going to give a shit about it. Well, little did I know next morning it was all of the fucking news. The <laughs> worldwide news. Worldwide news. Wow. Okay. So you, that, and then uh, Dana Plato, you wrote a book about a young act actress that they say committed suicide you wrote a book, which then I saw it recently. You ended up on Nancy Grace's show. And it was just interesting seeing you talk to Nancy Grace because this, again, I, I feel like the 90s, TMZ was such a big thing. But in the 90s, a lot of celebrities' lives started becoming a thing. But you, who you are and your history, seeing someone outside of that media world write a book about a celebrity what was it like putting yourself in because you literally put yourself in a position where you're putting yourself out there not knowing what's going to happen and what's going to come of it oh right so well that's that's fucking art dude isn't it isn't it mm -hmm. all of this entertainment performances so dana so it was just like this like i was doing an event an art event and put, bringing mm -hmm. bands in and we needed something that was going to get headlines so you okay. need those hooks and so you go through the checkout line at the grocery store and you see a newspaper a new national choir tabloids we had at the counter at the time and it says uh, Dana Plato missing and an underground person. I could find any motherfucker practically <laughs> you know, start calling around. So it's like, Oh, I'm going to find her and ask if she wants to do the event. So I did. Uh -huh. And, and that just worked out to be a big deal. And, and me and Dana became friends and, and I set up a recorder on the phone and we were going to do a book together. And, you know, the timing, she, I guess, just <laughs> the timing for you in general, how everything panned out, I guess. It was really sad. Cause it was the, she died the, 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 on mother's day the eve mm -hmm. mother's eve mother's day eve so her son called me asking where she was oh wow her, her child's he was a child he's dead now he killed himself as well and so this is the this is the the tragedy of our lives you know all mm -hmm. this kind of stuff is what life is real like like what really happens in life and all of the things i've seen from serial killers on up to outlaw bikers to the criminal Satanist, not all Satanists are criminal. Mm -hmm. Is is someone didn't hold them, someone didn't love them enough. And I know that's like a typical thing, but that's just mm -hmm. what it is. Turns people into monsters. So that's just a little taste of you in the 90s. Fast forward. Um, I'm trying to think. I see that you had tried a soda company. Yeah. 
moved to the middle of the woods. Oh, do, are you asking me about this? Yeah, I just want to, so people know who you are, because again, a lot of people oh. that I've talked to who I told them, listen, I'm actually going to be interviewing this guy. This is who he is. Now, a lot of people are just like, really, this is interesting. I want to hear, they want to hear about you. And a, a I'm lot giving of you the I, opportunity to right speak on. So on. yeah, I did a soda company because I got, you know, like, so looking back on my life, it's not even easy to look back because it gives me trauma mm-hmm. almost. I'm it's sorry, like, sorry. it's okay. It's cool. I, I, I really like your questions and how you go about everything. So I was interested in talking to you, but it's like, um, yeah, you get run out of towns. You literally get run out of towns doing controversial artwork and, and no one wants to help you. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we uh, went up to a small town to help my partner's father he was real sick and I wanted to help him out. And I'm like, I can't sell my, fucked up obscene stuff in the middle of the forest with all these old, you know, the blueberry fucking festival place. So I started a soda company to survive. Wow. So you, 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 you adapted. Yeah. In some way. I do all the time, but the problem is I'm a poor person, so I'm not allowed to have a soda pop company. When I started the soda company, everyone that told me there, they wouldn't help me out. But I'm like, yeah, I'm doing a soda company and the trucks are coming into town and the, leader of the chamber of commerce calls me, you can't do a soda. Come on. I'm like, I can, and I'm going to, uh-huh. he's like, well, you don't have a booth at the blueberry festival. You got to wait five years for him. I was like, I don't give a fuck. He's like, how are you going to sell any soda? I go, none of your fucking business. But how about this? I'll have fucking kids walk around that blueberry festival with little red wagons full of ice and soda pop selling my soda pop. And when those 20,000 people that come to your blueberry festival, I ask those kids, why is the soda outside the festival and not inside the festival? We're going to send them to your booth to ask. I'm going to give him a flyer and say, go ask Bob. And then the next day, Bob, Bob called me and said, I had two booths for my soda company and I didn't have to pay for them. That fuck you attitude and that I'm going to get shit done my way really well, comes into play. Yeah. But when you're a poor person, they're like, you can't do this. And I'm like, yeah. just stop me because I thought I really actually thought I had the right to do it. But let yeah. me tell all you poor people, you don't, you slobs fucking give up now. And I'm not only I'm, only, I'm almost not even fucking joking. Because I did the soda company and I was successful and they took it from me and they've done that repeatedly and they can because you don't have resources. You don't have a fucking lawyer in the family to help you out, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. This is what goes on. And it's it's it has been outrageous to watch. I outrageous how many times I've been through that. And at this age, I'm just like, I can't believe this is true. Like so. So do you think now? In this day and age in 2022, because now I, I see you have a uh, monkey fashion and you're still doing your thing. Do you think it's easier now for small entrepreneurs like, let's say, somebody like myself have an apartment, maybe has like a T-shirt idea, tries to put. Do you think it's it's easier now or no, it's saturated? It's the same thing. It's luck and it's nepotism. It's money. It's resources. Rich people go to art school. They come to the fucking, they come to the hood, steal graffiti ideas, go back and sell it to Nike for advertising and buy a a half a million dollar fucking home with that shit. And no one that, that inspired those looks got a dime. You look at old hip hop artists. They all die in their fifties. They created the beats. They created everything. The dime broke. Like one of the guys who created the, the most religious, like hip hop beat, the one that everyone riffed in the beginning that still Mm -hmm. goes on to this day. He died broke. Like that's the reality of this situation. And they, they, they keep us distracted somehow. And it's really fucked up, dude. But if I were to say, you know, you're doing a t-shirt company, you gotta have luck. You gotta have a hustle game, hard hustle to get somewhere. And I also think right now we're, we're, we're at a, we're at a moment of, I don't know. Mm-hmm. We don't know what's going to go on in the future, but everyone's making clothes. Everyone's got mm-hmm. a brand. Like when I was a kid, I was the only motherfucker in, in, in a, I was one of 10 people in Chicago who had a brand, you mm-hmm. know, now every person has a brand. If you don't, you're weird. And so you can't have all those brands and sell things and make a living. If everyone's making their own t-shirts, who's buying them. Mm-hmm. So when you Keith Herring, a- Keith Herring actually did a sort of fuck you when he found out that because he would go into the New York subway system and just write on those chalk, or like um, blanks uh, advertisement spots. He would take chalk and just start doing his drawings and get back on the train and go to another spot. And people were finding out who he was and they were going and ripping down the paintings from the subway station 
and putting it in museums to sell and market up. And when he found that out, he said, all right, fine. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start putting all my artwork on T-shirts and pins, and I'm going to sell it at a reasonable price to the consumer. Really? That's him? Yeah. That was him. Oh. In the, in, and so he said, all right, well, all my artwork is going to be accessible, but cheap T-shirts, cheap pins, the consumer could buy it. Yeah, I, ha I had a concept like that before, too, fat art for thin wallets. I wanted to open up a store and, and show artwork, but sell like postcards of the artwork because as, mm -hmm. like, as a broke person, I wanted art in my house, but the only thing I could put up was posters or postcards. Yeah. Like that was it. And everybody finds art in, in different things. Some people save things. They, that's why I guess that saying is one man's garbage is, is another man's treasure. And looking at your art, I remember listening to the podcast. It was, I think it's called Speak of the Devil. You had mentioned at one point when you, I believe you were homeless, but you would go to local thrift stores yeah. and you would buy things and you would make art out of it. So you would yeah. take somebody's cheap garbage that they wanted to get rid of at a thrift store and then make something out of it. So like, that's 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 always been interesting. That's why I find your art very interesting because you, because I want to ask you that like this, exactly. Well, now how did you do something like that? Well, I just you know like that. What you're saying, go to the thrift store. You know, like it starts with the idea. Like you know, I want to. We want you know, I, I I'm looking to do something different. I'm not looking to paint like everyone else painted. I don't really care if you can paint realistically either because there's photos. So I'm looking to do something that hasn't been done or I haven't seen. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that concept was just go to a thrift store and take things that people would call. Look at my cookie jar. It's art. And artists know it's not art. It's not art. OK, so we're going to fucking show you we're going to make it real art. We're going to go in there and take a hammer to it and put 16 eyeballs on it or whatever. I, you know, put bones sticking on it. You know, we just took this fake art and made it real art and that was the concept with with that kind of stuff now do you think art the way to create art is is through destruction because you could take a piece of marble that looks beautiful and you have to obviously break it apart to make a statue for you it's it was i guess taking things and breaking it apart and making it something new so in order to create art do we have to destroy do you think first and foremost in some form well, see that's a perspective like almost a philosophical perspective because mm -hmm. so for me I, you know what slaps are? They're stickers, right? You slap mm -hmm. stickers, sticker art, slap art, street art, poster mm -hmm. art, wheat pasting, graffiti. I love all that. I love yeah. slaps. I, I'm a slap artist right now. What I get off on the most is making a bunch of slaps and sticking them on poles as I walk around. I fucking love that. That's the greatest. Like, uh -huh. that's one of the best. I have a fun time doing that. And just that's old street team, too. That's how right. we, a lot of old street teams started. Right. We well, what, were you, what were you asking? What'd you ask them? So I wanted to know. Oh, violence, like, destruction. Yeah, destruction in order to create. Okay. okay, so there was a woman over and she's yelling about these people putting up stickers and the graffiti and, you know, it's messing up my town and I pay taxes and I go, I pay taxes. And she goes, yeah, so what? And I go, I want the sticker on the pole. She goes, what? And I go, right. So me and you standing on one side of the, on the pole, looking at the sticker, you take it off because you pay tax dollars and you own that pole just as much as I do. And when you take it off, I put it back on because I own the pole just as much as you do. So she sees the sticker art as destructive. Mm -hmm. I don't. I see it as beautifying. I see it mm -hmm. as communication. Someone's reaching out. Mm -hmm. So do you have to destroy in order to create? Um, or is creation destruction? I, you know, it, 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 is, it is for every single person that looks at it their own thing. Some people have seen my artwork or things, seen, 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 seen things I do, and it's, it's made them cry or is they think there's hate involved in it, or they project all this stuff on me. And for a while I couldn't come. I was so afraid. And I was so like self-censoring. I didn't know how to communicate myself about this. I'm like, I don't even know how to talk about these subjects. They're so harsh and people just are not willing to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard to talk about sometimes thinking about this stuff. My mind goes all over the place. So do when now being in 2022, when, when someone younger than myself finds Shane Bugby on Instagram, w w what do you normally get response wise? Are you getting more positive reactions? Because I feel like a lot of people now have become so numb to things or so used to shock value that now it's just commonality in some form. It's a generational observation. So, so I'm a Gen X. <laughs> how how boomers saw what I and I'm non-generational because I'm an artist. So I'm like a fucking kid 24 seven. 
Mm-hmm. But so how boomers saw what I did and what we do, they saw it differently. Millennials interpreted what we did the same way we interpreted what the hippies did. We were like, fuck you. We hate you. Mm-hmm. This didn't work. What you're doing is failing us. You're fucking destroying the world. And that's what they did to my stuff. A lot of people came at old stuff. I didn't like this is awful. You're destroying the world. Now, the 20 somethings, the tw- kids are 20. Like, yeah, I hear it. You sound angry. But I don't think you sound, you know, they're, they're breaking it apart psychologically. You just mm-hmm. need a hug. You just need to talk. <laughs> you need some space. You need to keep some space for yourself, some self-care. And mm-hmm. everything they're saying, I'm like, knowing, I'm like, you know, if I had that shit talking to me, then I'd be, a, it'd be you know, it's nice. I, mm-hmm. I enjoy counseling and self-care and all that stuff. So mm-hmm. I, like, I like the woke movement myself. Yeah. Because it's weird because I'm talking to a, a I guess, a, a Gen Z. I guess that's a, now the new generation coming up. Because I'm, I'm interested in, in knowing, that's why I had a, a talk with my friend John, who's the high school teacher, because I want to know what are the kids like today compared to my millennial generation. And the, the person, young person is telling me that as a one, she feels like a lot of kids her age don't want social media accounts anymore, but they feel like they have to be on so online. A lot of them don't feel heard or don't feel valued. But when it comes to um, sort of art or feeling, um, she says a lot of them are just very, and I don't know what's your take on nihilism, but she feels like a lot of people, a lot of kids her age are becoming nihilistic without even realizing what it means. Like they just feel lost and not heard. So, you know, it's just, it's just, I'm always interested in hearing from one generation to the other, how do, in my generation, where's the commonality when (laughs) things feel so different now? Well, I think one of the commonalities is that uh, youthful nihilism is there. I mean, I felt that way when I was young too. What is it all about? Why am I here? Why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know. I, let's face it. If you're 20 years old, I'd be fucking nihilistic now too with plagues running around the fucking world and mm-hmm. the uncertainty of what's going on. Like it's fucking nuts. So as a 20 year old, I'd be like, you know, what do you, you have to really have your head together to go, I'm going to go into science to do this for oil companies to fix pollution you have to you have to come from the stock of person or an educated person to dream that dream even you have to come from lawyers and scientists and and so because you had mentioned obviously we're at a we're at a moment of revolution we've been at this moment for 10 years now in 2025 canada and other countries are getting ready to take in american refugees Uh so when you ask me that question i think the kids that are nihilistic uh are are there for you know the time is is so different now there's nothing to compare it to yeah it feels like things are going to break loose here we're going to lose democracy you know there's it's a really heavy thing i think sometimes for me from my own observation i think everything is just a paradox at this point i think it's just like it's a it's a it's a it's a never-ending comedy of some degree so it could be a dark comedy. It could be a happy comedy, but it's it is always going to be irony behind everything now. I, I think because of social media and being online and trying to present yourself in a certain way, uh, this is why when it for me art wise, the kind of art I like is stuff that skews reality and um, fantasy. So like fake advertisements, for example. And I try doing that if you, in my Instagram. If you go past my stuff, I started making like online flyers for bands or doing something weird and interesting because no one was doing it. It felt like no one was really trying to speak about what the fuck is going on. So, for example, I made one about uh, the Chinese government and Disney and how evil Disney is. But no one gives a fuck because they have their baby Yoda from the new star Wars thing. So yeah. like, you know, it's just, um, I don't know. I, it's, it's now NFTs are a thing. And I love you it. as an artist, like, but the thing is, is like, there's so many arguments of just like, you, you know, the internet allow gives you such freedom 
you, you don't need to buy a book anymore. You just type in PDF right. at the end of a search and you get it, you know? Right, right. We're at a moment in time where, where we have to redefine things. And we mm-hmm. have to, we have to re-up the, we started this with talking about free speech and how yeah. we're at a moment where we do have to discuss, we have to fine tune that concept, but we can't sit there and say it's, it didn't work. It, mm-hmm. it, it's the most ridiculous thing. We're born with it. Mm-hmm. It's not even, it's like a, it's a birthright. It's not something a government fucking gave me. But we have to, we definitely have to look at what's happening and how things can be weaponized. Words that weren't able to be weaponized, like you can weaponize a word now. That is a concept that has to have, we have to deal with that kind of stuff. And and I'm not sure how, but that has to, that we are in a new era. So we have like blog, like podcast. We needed new words at, in, in Gen X. Mm-hmm. You motherfuckers got to come up with new words and we're all, com- we're, we're all coming up with new words racing into this new millennium. One thing I would advise artists is don't look backwards when you uh, like, I'm going to do a book. I kept thinking that I'm like talking to my friend because we're doing this, this satanic almanac and all this. And we're going to do it in a book. And I'm like, mm-hmm. we're a bunch of fucking idiots to keep doing these things in books. I'm like why books are cool. I'm like, yeah, because that's what we saw when we were, everyone was cool when we were kids. Look at, they're doing a book. Mm-hmm. The teacher has a book. The mom is going to read a book to us at when she sits down and puts us to sleep. So we want to do a book. But why don't we want to do a 30 second TikTok that smashes just as hard as a fucking 300 page book? Because some of those TikToks smash. I mean, they're like, fucking, holy shit, that was great. In one minute, you've just explained the world. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, I love that. I, I want to get on a TikTok and figure out how do kids do that. I want to hang out with young kids and say, teach me TikTok. So like, with me, I do street photography and I, I'm not a fan of money. I hate money. I know it's necessary, but I fucking hate money. So. Uh, I see all these 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 photographers on Instagram is so fucking oversaturated. Instagram is so oversaturated, really trying to hit a dent. Everything is. Yeah, it's hard. Think about it. I feel like- Obscenity saturated. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so then, so then I'm just like, so I don't want to. I don't want to sell copies of my photos because I don't want to have to sell anything, which means I don't want to have to print photos of my work and give it to somebody. So I said, what's the best option? I guess I have to spend money in order to express myself. So I bought it. dot com. I got it uh, one of those Adobe memberships and they host your thing. I said, I'm just going to make free zines on my free time of my photography and writings. And I'm just going to put it out there. And, you know, yeah. and I love that. And I would suggest archive.org. Archive.org. I'm going to keep they're, that in they're, mind. They're free, mm-hmm. but they're trying to, they have their, but their, their intent isn't a social media company. Their intent is to build the world's biggest known library ever known bigger than the Greek library. So they're collecting all of the information. They want it all and they have gotcha. servers all over the world. So in case someone attacks the server in America, they're keeping all of this information. So I would, gotcha. I, I think they're, they're, they're noble. Their project is noble and they'll care for your stuff. Unlike, so, unlike, they care about so, your information. Unlike Facebook, which is, or other companies, they only care about your, your presence, your activity, your engagement. So as an artist in the artist community nowadays, what, how do you think an artist would be able to balance the idea of being an individual and expressing art in an original way while also being part of a collective, whether it be part of a gallery or a art group? How do they remain an individual while also trying to keep a community from imploding or being filled with self-righteous or self pretentious assholes who think oh. their shit is better than the other. Well, co- our, our, being an artist is an individual thing, but then you collaborate. You have to, to make a film. It's usually a collab. Mm-hmm. So when you collaborate with things, what I would say is leave your fingerprints all over it. Like mm-hmm. grab your friend's ass. I don't know what to tell you, but you know, just put your fingers every, and I'm not, I don't mean, uh, I mean, consensually. Yeah. yeah, I, I know. What you mean. I mean, put your finger, get your shit all over it. If you do, if you, you have a, if you have hand, you have a style, make sure it gets in everywhere. So when people look at it, they're like, man, Shane, Shane was all over that fucking piece. Shane was all over this fucking thing. You know, that's it. You compete, but you have fun competing. Like, like, like the, this kid I was arguing with the other day, he's like, I, I just want to get a photo of this thing. And then we'll, we'll do this stuff. And you know, 30 artists or hundred artists. He's like, well, I'll take the photo. No problem. I'll do that. I got that. I got that. And I'm like, are you looking for it? He goes, well, yeah, I'm looking for a thanks. I go, why would I thank you? Like if I had 30 artists in the room, every single one of us would go, I'll take the photo. Uh-huh. Cause we all want to take, we all want the credit. We all, that's like, that's a gift, dude. That's not, yeah. a, that's not work. That's not a favor. Like I'm If I said, yeah, you can do the photo. It'd be me giving you a favor. Mm-hmm. 
you know, because I want to take the photo too. I want all the credit. See, so he's trying, this kid naturally is trying to get his fingerprints all over fucking everything in a cola. I'll take the photo. I'll do this. I'll do that. And so, <laughs> you know, that's what I would try to do. But I'm, I'm rotten to ask that because you look at my track record. When I get dropped in an area, I break apart communities. They just get destroyed. Look uh-huh. at the church of Satan. <laughs> look at the Portland street art scene. Even in Chicago, things are coming apart. So I don't even know what happens, but I just ask the right questions. And all of a sudden, so we, so we had, so you, I, this is where it gets kind of, I, I have really got to ask some questions then because Go. you, um, you have made these, these, these uh, videos on Instagram talking. It sounded like from what I heard that you were trying to pick a war with uh, the church of Satan or the satanic temple. It felt like you were trying to like start some type of like, dra- I wouldn't say drama, maybe more of like, get more people and just like, what the fuck is he talking about? I, I want to know what's going on. What, what was that about? Can you, then you well, start putting on- out these things, the old on- for example. I have an ongoing beef with these people. I was, I was a friend with Anton LaVey. I was in the church. Of, I am in the church of Satan. They don't kick you out, but they will tell you, you know, like, Oh, it was an honorary. They, they made up something new because of me, honorary membership. So they blame like Marilyn Manson and me. We were just, we were, we were just given honorary memberships because we were friends of LaVey, but we're not real members, but we're honorary members. Cause they can't, if you kick someone out of the church of Satan, you're basically, <laughs> you know, telling them they did something wrong, which you don't do in Satanism. So it's just sort of funny. They can't uh-huh. kick me out. So they're creatively trying to figure out a way, but, but we have beef and that's the thing, you know, Satanists don't get along. It's an individual thing. You're not supposed to, it's not about rules. We're supposed to fight. We're supposed to argue. It's a philosophical debate. It's just like me and you arguing about free speech. Let's say mm-hmm. it's, that's all it is. You know, that's what Satanism is, is the conversation. Satanic temple I helped to start. Mm-hmm. So I definitely have a big, I, Doug, uh, Lucy and Greaves, I, uh, he's, we were friends for over a decade. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's stuff that came to fruit based on projects that we had worked on for a long time. And um, yeah, I got beef with guy. I mean, personal beef. And then the understanding of, you know, where he wants to go with things, why we stopped working together. You know, he was, he wants to take a, he wants to take advantage of the juggalo class, let's say. Mm-hmm. Okay. They're only consumers. Poor people are consumers that, you know, they'll be treated the same way they've always been treated mm-hmm. and controlled. Doug, Doug is into control. I am not. I'm into liberty. I'm into freedom. And I'm not a libertarian, let's say, but, but I'm into uh, less control, no control. I'm not into that kind of stuff. And I think leaving our laws in America, are, a lot of them are coercive control. So I'm, I'm away, I'm away from that. I'm not saying I'm in the uh, concept of someone being able to walk in your house. People take that to an extreme. I'm into, you know, I'm not into having a bunch of laws put on people. So for you as in your history with that, how do you feel about modern Satanists today? Because I, sometimes I feel like for them, it's an aesthetic and it's not really they're not really going by with what I guess the message is or the mission statement is of, you know, the satanic modern, church. I just modern Satanism is, is become popular. So because of what we did with the satanic temple mm-hmm. and so what, do, what do I think of modern Satanism? I just put out a book called the satanic almanac 2021, and I'm going to put it up for free online as a digital copy. I won't put out the second part of the interview for free, but me and Stanton LeVay talk about the modern um, Satanism and how it is and how we need to fix it for the future. So we start to define the future of Satanism there. Mm-hmm. Um, the church of Satan used to interview people before they let them in. And someone mm-hmm. like me, I was a you know friend with Anton LeVay. So I'd have to bring someone and say, Hey, this guy's going to wants to be a member. Let him join. He's cool. Mm-hmm. And the satanic temple just wanted as many people as they could get. So we just didn't do that or they didn't. I didn't. That was <clears throat> anyway. And so um, that's what happens. It does become something that a lot of um, desperate people cling to for identity. And a lot of people who have issues of have lack of power, want power, they're attracted to the goat. It's a power symbol. Mm-hmm. And so it becomes it becomes something to manipulate not only poor people, but mentally ill people. 
mm -hmm. people that aren't really understanding how to how to deal with with abuse let's say stuff like that in their life yeah mm -hmm. so um that's how i see that i mean i i think modern mo what you're seeing today as far as satanism goes in a thousand years will be looked at as wow this was when they were defining what satanism is and these are the people who defined it mm -hmm. you know these are the the um what do they call them? The apostles, Levay's apostles. Interesting. We were, you know, we were his, we are his prophets, and so the people, the old guard of Levay, I'm the last of the old guard. I was the last person he made a priest before he died. Mm -hmm. So all the old, all the people who knew Levay are dying, and we, the old guard, has to trans. We have to translate what Levay said to people uh -huh. before we die. Mm -hmm. So we have to talk, you know, like Peter Gilmer does a fine job of that over at church of Satan.com. He's, he, you know, he, he can try, you know, but, but that's, what's, that's what's happening now. And I think what you're seeing is the start of a religion that'll be like 10,000 years old. Mm -hmm. Christianity and Catholicism are dead. And you can see the society that we built around it is falling. It's, it's all falling. All of this stuff is falling. <clears throat> and people are desperately trying to cling to something to believe to. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So you have the anti-vaxxer movements, you have QAnon becoming their new religions, their, their new things to worship or believe in, to believe without any evidence, instead of just snapping into it and going, yeah, we just, you know, we want to deal with science, you know, mm -hmm. looking at our, looking at our society, it's wrapped in science, engineering, art, you know, just respect, mm -hmm. or, or go live in a mud hut in the woods, mm -hmm. you know. It's weird because I've been re I, I haven't finished it yet, but I started reading uh, Brave New World. I don't know if you ever read that book oh, from yeah. uh, uh, Hug mm -hmm. Um I can see why people will say that they, they, um, they're they seeing that more than 1984. Because a lot of people think that like the world is going to be like a 1984 sort of feel. But Brave New World, I feel like, is going to be the next goal towards some type of dystopian, utopian world. Well, um, ask those savages and the... People. Ask the people, ask the Palestinians how they feel about that one. And then we say, well, I, I'm, I like the 1984 one's pretty good. Cause there's a boot on my fucking neck right now. As I ask you, answer you. <laughs> like, so, so I think when they were talking about that, they were seeing it happen around them much as we're seeing it now grow, mm -hmm. you know, but it's almost like a lot of like, when I did that, that road trip, that year long road trip and did that, uh, this book and stuff, one of the uh, the people there's a popular movement online now uh per, people living living in a van or whatever it's a whole movement. okay yeah, van life yeah van life well we me and my partner were the first people to put that shit on and i'm not kidding i know it sounds extraordinary when you're 20 but back yeah, then no yeah. one was doing this and we traveled the country for a year and a half and did that anyway uh talking about that i forget what i'm saying i get thrown off i'm sorry no i kind of feel that it's i start talking about my past i go into this Mm, blackout almost sometimes i feel like my life is like forrest gump because i've had an interesting life i've yeah. been in this i've worked in the circus for a couple months i um i was one of the first people to get arrested uh during occupy wall street on the first day i started occupy new jersey with just starting making a twitter account i helped with, i helped with occupy new york at the groundwork where there was eight people sitting there and my buddy in the van um flux he had the the bus the media bus there and i was working with him on that and i'm in i'm in chicago doing stuff and then all of a sudden it hit and he's like dude you got to help me there there's so much money flying into my paypal account we can't figure this out we got to figure someone out to take it as a nonprofit. profit they'll tax us we got to, you know it can't come to us they'll take you know we we, we got to send this money somewhere else so yeah. i hooked him up with a non-profit person and they they <laughs> jived real quick and drew up things and you know so it was like it, it happened quick that fucking but the happened. thing is it's like i feel like a lot of the younger generation they don't they're not taking the time to, to discover shit like this that happened before their time like some some people don't even know what Occupy was, you know. They, they some of them don't even really care about nine eleven, for example. And it's a generational that's, thing, I know. But ain't that ain't that crazy? But that's our job to to lift that information out there, to get it out there. So for me, talking to you, this is part of the job of an artist mm -hmm. is to make sure our history goes from my mouth to your ears, mm -hmm. so it's not lost and all that stuff. So it goes on archive.org and it's available. At least it's available if someone looks for it, you know? So you, you, we've got to, you know, we've got to tell our history. That's how the Black Panther stuff, dude, like 
Fred Hampton, everyone knows who this motherfucker is today. No one knew who he was when I was a kid. Uh-huh. I'm 20. I'm, I just quit drinking 21, start working at the Bucktown pub, and these guys start cluing to me. You know, I'm working with Black Panthers, White Panthers, hip, yippies. And I'm like, there's no way cops do that. They, you know, this bullshit. No one murdered Fred Hampton. He carrying around shotguns. Of course, he's going to get shot. Well, next weekend, they come in and present everything and show me the truth. And I'm like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. And then and they brought me into this. Mm-hmm. These old radical hippies brought me in. And now I try to bring in radicals or people, too. I mm-hmm. made a mistake with Doug and the, mm-hmm. search, the Satanic Temple. They have no ties to the underground. They have no ties to Satanism. They have ties to government agencies. Mm-hmm. And they have ties to Ivy League schools. So put those numbers in your arithmetic when you do this. Think mm-hmm. about what I'm saying there. You know, okay. Anyway. <laughs> I, I, I was saying that with my buddy, uh, with John earlier. We were talking about, um, so we were getting into this conversation. For me, I don't take anything as dog. Like I don't, I'm, I'm very much like Bruce Lee's philosophy. Take what works for me. The rest could get thrown out but I'm never going to adapt to what I believe, like what I'm taking in. I'm always going to be trying to adapt to different situations and just grow as a person. So um, we started getting into like politicians and he mentioned uh, Alexandra Cortez. And and I'm the type of person that uh, sort of just like you, you don't, I don't take these politicians or uh, grassroots sort of thing. I don't believe in anymore i i don't think there's no any such thing as grassroots there's got to be some entity behind that person that's paying them in some form in order to speak or push some sort of agenda that's why like now that i think about it, i feel like occupy for example was more of like a it was something to push but it wasn't going the direction that we as the people wanted it to go it was more of just a facade to try and kick the system in a, in a, in a way to, in order for them to gain more power. I'm trying, I'm sounding very like, well, no, a lot of times when these things happen, they get co-opted by people and they do get, they, 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 these movements do get turned. That's what basically has happened with Satanism. It got co-opted by some Ivy league cops. Okay. Uh And they don't give a fuck. They don't give a fuck, but you know, about, about, you know, business where it's going to take them, how they're going to rise how many laws, how, how many lawyers they're going to employ, all that kind of shit. <clears throat> and so it gets co-opted. And that's just the thing. You, you know, you, you have to pay attention. And I think, you know, don't don't believe. Don't be a believer. Ask a lot of questions of people. Like, you know, it's the way it is. We're, we keep looking backwards for things a lot of times that have already been answered with technology. Like someone was telling me some stuff like that. And we, they we're going on about city problems. I'm going, like, you know, it's all been answered. She goes, what? I go, we can have robots take care of this stuff. Like right fucking now, they could release the robots. So why aren't we in that discussion and not a discussion about what's happened for 30 fucking years up to this point? Because everything mm-hmm. that happened in the past is garbage at this point in this era. I mean, we have to I think a lot of people are, are, are want to cling on to something that's being that's just dying. They know. Yeah, that they know it's, mm-hmm. it's safety. Right. You know what you like. I want to keep going back to it. And but as I know, trying new meals, I'm like, that sounds fucking disgusting. I eat. I'm like, that's really good. My mind just couldn't wrap around it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's that's I don't know what to say. I just can only concept, you know, about each person, what they think. My my idea is like I try to keep my mind in the future. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen in 10 years? What's going to happen 100 years? How can we how can we get people to talk about universal income more? So when you talk about AOC, no matter which way you think about her, she does amazing work because she brings concepts like um, universal income to a popular, uh, to a pop cult, pop, pop cult audience. And they start talking about things they've never heard of. So, you know, everyone, everyone serves their purpose and not everyone could be that. The, and not everyone that you look at is going to serve the purpose that you think they should. But That's the thing is the purpose. Perspective plays a huge part. In any, that's why I feel like I like to say all art sucks, but it's just based on perspective because it's based on the individual if they even like the artwork. But at the same time, that's the artist's perspective of their view on life. But when it comes to stuff like education, um, I don't know. I think 
to a certain extent, the individual needs to learn to have motivation to self-educate and learn something like economics, for example, learn how, because then I, I, for me, I think it makes it easier for them to comprehend why the world is the way it is right now when it comes to terms of the economic I standpoint. Like what you're, I like what you're saying, but the problem is when you say the individual, you can't say there's no general term for that. So you mm-hmm. can't say the individual needs to learn like this because so many people are lucky they can, they can read a book. Yeah. They don't have, they don't have, um, what is it? That's true. Resources. I, I, I write and just, I, I used to open up books to the back all the time when I was younger. It takes me so long to read a book. It's so hard for me. I have to turn off all the radios. I have to be silent. And it takes a long time for me to read a book. I have to read the page two or three times. So I think like, the concept of our society is we're supposed to help the least, the weakest of ourselves. We're supposed mm-hmm. to be able to help them out in a way where if they can't read that, they still get, that still benefits them. And uh, how, how, where did we forget that? That we're supposed to, you know, take care of the weakest because, because the idea is knowing that I, I, I think the concept there is that you're going to be in that position at some point in your life. And you want people to be nice to you, not mean. We're all going to be in that weak position, that humiliating weak spot. For some, for somebody, I have to, I, I have to compliment you, Shane. I really have to compliment you right now because for somebody that the work that you've done that I've seen obviously comes from a place inside of you where you you definitely experience things in life that a person shouldn't experience at such a young age but from every video that i've seen of you every time i've heard you speak you've always had this calmness about you that i feel like it's the art is where you really express yourself it's like yelling in an empty room that's what you do in your art but then you're so calm but then i've i've been listening to the speak of the devil podcast and you talking about mental health you know, I, I, when was that podcast put out? Was it a couple of years ago, like a, 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 a 2019 and 2020 within that time, within the, that time span, I'm, I should I'm, say 2021, 2021. It was right. You know, right you definitely, and you definitely grew since then. Do you feel like, I, I feel like you've actually been a lot calmer. You still have a lot to say. How, how has mental health, been such an important factor in your life what got you to the point because what what i what in what one of my favorite art pieces that i recently found out about you that i that or installations that you did was the installation of self de, uh destructive where you had uh, had documented yourself on a couch i believe it was for a year or few or more um of friends that would come visit you yourself and um, it was because of the passing of your dog. And since then, working on yourself, how have you felt like you've changed for the better or maybe for the worse or maybe no change at all? Like, if you could reflect on yourself right now. Because that was a great, and I thought that was a great piece. That was that was such honesty. Like, out of all the work you've done, whether it be through um, um posters that you have behind you to your zines and whatnot that I felt like that was really putting yourself in a vulnerable state for people to see what was it like behind closed doors for Shane. So so I'm just wanting to know for you mental health wise, how has this journey been for you? Well, that's a real hard show to bring up because it's, you know, it's hard to think about that one. Mm-hmm. Really and I'm sorry hard. if I do. If no, I, no, it's, it's all good, dude. I'm, I'm good. I would have said that okay. up front. I don't want to talk about something. I'm, I'm, I'm just letting you know if I sound it. But to, there's a handful of things you asked there. So it's like. Sorry, I get all over the place, too. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. Like, so you sound great, dude. This is your first. You're just jumping into this stuff now today. You sound great. You sound pro. You sound great. <laughs> um. What's the difference or, you know, for me, I guess I stand here today um, damaged. I've been, you know, I've been run out of multiple towns for 30 years. I've been had the shit kicked out of me for my artwork. So I don't know how much longer I could take that. Mm-hmm. You know, that's really uh, exhausting. 
And so that's probably what you hear in my voice is just like, I'm, I'm exhausted by it. I, you know, you go through something that was life changing, you know, and I've gone through something that's life changing over the last six or seven years. And that was go to counseling. Mm -hmm. And when I go to counseling, all that kind of stuff, counseling's the hardest thing I ever did because you got to deal with the reality of the situation, not your, not your delusions or not your, the, the image you have of yourself or the image other people gave you, to you, built you up. You got to deal with just the mathematics of it. And as an artist or a Satanist or all these things, last thing I want to do is be typical. I'm so how like, do you, I'm not like you. I'm not like your friends. I'm not like anyone. But when you go into mental health care, one of the first things my counselor at the time, Julie, told me, I go, listen, I'm a Satanist. You're not going to be able to do this with. She goes, I know you. I got a book on you. I go, you do? Which one? She goes, that one over there. And she points to PTSD and depression. She goes, I bet you I know who you are. Give me three sessions. I'll know just who you are. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I took her on the test. I, she won. And that was the start of that journey. And, you know, I, it, 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 it tore apart my life. Co counseling is like Cthulhu. It tore apart everything. But as I stand here today, now this is a good question. Yes. I, I, you asked about that. The part of it was I talk, talk about life almost tearing me apart. But here's the weird thing. The really surreal thing I was just talking to my friend about, like, it's almost embarrassing to admit. But this thing about learning what boundaries are mm -hmm. when I'm this old and using boundaries and telling my friend, like, I was talking to someone at the coffee shop the other day, a woman, and I didn't feel like I had a rash, a mental rash. I didn't feel irritated. I didn't feel all these weird things. And I get involved with very dysfunctional, you know, outrageous people because <laughs> mm -hmm. I got issues. <laughs> And I was telling her, I was like, it's just like, just talking about the most mundane shit, but there was just like, it was calm. It was normal. It was like shit I feel like I would see on TV. Mm -hmm. And she talks about how when you're raised with abuse and stuff like that, you look for the most abusive person or the saddest person in the room because that's who you got a key on to survive. So that's what you're attracted to. You're attracted to these mm -hmm. horrible people. You know, and once those things come to light and you start putting the boundaries and like, oh, Young man, what you just said to me is not appropriate. Don't raise your tone with me. You know, say that and you'd be able to say, or nonviolent communication is a book I read. It was great because mm -hmm. it's like, remember me, the satanic Bible. Mm -hmm. It's basically like how to get what you want, how to get your needs met without shitting on others. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's great. So once I started reading that stuff and watching, after you start telling your counselors the truth, as an artist, I'm a truth seeker and, and I'm a truth speaker. So ain't that a bitch after going to three years of fucking counseling? I got to look at my art career and go, I've been lying to every motherfucker around. I'm a lying piece of really? shit. Whoa. Everything I did before was a fucking joke. It was identity. It was stuff to cover things up. It was stuff to cover. It wasn't honest at all, probably. Who knows? I'm not even going to look back at it. But I know uh -huh. this date forward, I can be an honest artist. I can now say... You know, I come from this place. I was an abused person. I come from being poor. A lot of I look at the past of my stuff and I go, oh, there's shame. I'm ashamed of being poor. I'm trying to act like I'm, I'm everyone else. Uh -huh. I'm trying to act like I fit in. I never fit in. I, never I don't did. know. I have to disagree because that, that, that insulation that you did of self-destruction, it was, I think that was opening up. That was you opening your doors to people to say, like, every, after what you know about me, this is who I really am. And, and so if people don't know this SMAR project, I'm going to give a synopsis real quick and correct me if I do make mistakes. But the video I saw, you had create, recreated the room, the living room that you were in. So you had the couch as the display. You had the recliner. I remember you had the table with uh, the Hershey chocolate bars. Every, somebody could take a chocolate bar and you sit and talk to them. And then you had pictures on the wall, I think a projection screen of photos that you have taken. And one of them that really caught my eye was the one of your feet from a point of view of you on that, on that recliner. And, and why, as a photographer, I love – every photographer that really loves photography will tell you the, 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 the photo itself has to tell a story without you having to explain it. And that photo right there of your feet really told me how you felt at that time. 
And that was a that was you trying to be vulnerable. You really put yourself yeah. out there doing that piece. Did, how how freeing did you feel? Did you feel like you were letting some weight off your shoulders when you finally opened your door for people to come see? That was the start of what you're talking about. You're right about that. And I would say my sculptures are fairly honest. I just I don't uh -huh. know what I'm sculpting. And and so they do help me understand. It's not like I, I'm a you know my sculpture stuff like that. The, the abstracts aren't aren't lies, uh -huh. but they are based on a on a on truths mm -hmm. that weren't true. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I can understand a woman's problem now. I don't look at my mom in such a hard way because I didn't mm -hmm. understand what she went through as a woman. And I'm and it's weird because I've been getting I've been getting that revelation re recently too when it comes to the person of the opposite sex and having more empathy. Yeah, in in seeing the struggles that it men struggle too. Don't get us wrong; men are more likely oh, to commit suicide. But at the same worse time, off. yeah. Worse at the same time, point. though, I've come to realize men need to be a little more accountable for. We need to be a little more accountable for our actions and what we do. We need to be able. We men need to be able to fucking cry. They need to be able to ask for help. They need to be able mm -hmm. to say, I, "I need help." But when exactly. the man says, "I need help," he's thrown to the garbage can. He's worthless. Mm -hmm. He's looked at in society poorly. So if men can't, if you can't, and that's what I had to do, this big thing, I was able to ask for help and I was able to take help. And that was the biggest part of my change before that. I was like, yeah, fuck you. Don't talk. Don't try to pick me up off the ground. I'll fucking smack you. I'll get up myself, you know, toxic. Yeah. And so that was one of the biggest parts for me, but that art show you talk. You, you, I thought you had, I don't know. Did you ask me something about that art show? So, yeah. So what I want to ask is what, what got you like when you started off doing that, was that the initial plan or is that something that organically crept into your mind during that time span? Well, unfortunately, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that happened in my life around that time, there was a weird conspiracy underneath it that I can't mm -hmm. talk about right now. So you don't have to talk about it then. So it's it's so bizarre. It it could only, probably only be expressed into a film. But <laughs> at that moment, I started going to counseling, mm -hmm. and that's when I was like, and my my dog, a dog that taught me a lot, Cheyenne, she passed away. Mm -hmm. And when she passed away, it, it triggered me out to have a breakdown, and I sat in this recliner basically for a year which you know and and i remember cheyenne died and i came home buried her and i moved the couch and i after a year i was like you know i got up off the couch was like i gotta get to, i gotta you know i'd been to the hospital something happened and i was like i gotta get healthy i gotta I'm, I'm killing myself i'm dying here what am i doing i gotta get out of this and i moved the couch and i'm like holy shit and i was like i haven't created art in a whole year this is the longest i've ever gone without creating art and I look at my iPad and I've been taking all these pictures of people visiting with me, my feet up because I just reclined when my friends would come over and I was basically like in a hospital bed mm -hmm. and I put my feet up in the recliner and I take a photo of them and then put the iPad down and listen to them. And in between my feet, what I used to see when my feet were like that was my dog, Cheyenne. She would sit in the corner mm -hmm. and as I looked through my feet, I would see her. So I was taking these photos in between my feet. But when I was taking them, I was thinking about, I was shut my eyes thinking about her. Mm. And so that was when someone, then someone asked me to do an art show for nefarious reasons, but I didn't know that. And I still, that's no, that, neither here up nor there. Yeah. I did the art show. And uh, I put up all the photos of the people that visited, like it was a living room, put the couch up, put speakers. I put speakers and then I had Cheyenne's dog pillow where it was. And I had a huge gold frame, big thousand dollar frame photo of her on the thing. And then underneath the thing I had, I was reading poetry to her. Oh, wow. And underneath the couch, there's another speaker. I'm, I'm talking to Amy. I'm reading something to her. And there's two videos going. There's one of my ex-partner, Amy, and there's uh -huh. one of the dog. And they're both going. And that's basically like when I, when I was sitting on the couch in depression, eating chocolate bars, that's basically what I was you know, so people that were depressed had depression and stuff would sit down and go, man, this is just like that. This is just like having the dark. So you, you, so, all right. So it kind of makes me think of the, of the one artist who made music uh, to try and represent what a person is like, who's going through dementia. So from the whole album, from track one to, I think it's wow. like 25 tracks, the, the, the sounds pr progress worse and worse and just becomes distorted, but you're getting that, that um, feeling of like, this is what a person is going through. So what I'm comparing that with you is you, um, 
what you did with the projection screen of showing the photos is in you're showing and people who relate to it. I'm the same way. So I thinking I too was, much, thinking too much. So I was, I was diagnosed with bipolar manic depression and I through meditation. Now it's helped a lot, but like I had even up to last year, I overthink, but my mind goes a thousand miles a minute and I'm having thoughts of like shit that happened to me as a kid to, to what happened for the day, to the future, to, Things right. I'm remembering what I used to do when I was drunk and it was going like that. So like I could see how people would came up to me like, damn, dude, I know what that feels like because you showed it. You represented it in the visual aspect. Yeah, that, that made me very, 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 very proud. That was the first that was like I was really proud of that event. And it helped me understand like, oh, like, OK, so when my dog died, mm -hmm. my best friend, my my partner, who we had done these creative projects for about a decade together a little more than a decade but on and on you know about i would if I, I have to give this person credit i would say about a decade okay I, yeah i have to do everything mathematical now that it's a fucking breakup and accounting so mm -hmm. but anyway this person quit being a creative and they went to work for a bank at mm -hmm. the same time my dog died so i sat at home for at, alone for a year, year year just sat there and thought and, and mm -hmm. that's that's where that art show came from I was glad to get an art show out of it because I was like, well, I guess I did make artwork out of my year and I made an artwork out of it. And I got a book and I'll try to, if I find one, I'll try to send you one of the ones I've laying around, but. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. That was the start of it, dude. You're right. That was the start of it. That was the start of me showing a side that was scary for men to show is it, scary to this day for men to show. And I can mm. tell you that I was treated poorly and decently after that. I know that some people saw that, see that stuff as a weakness mm -hmm. and they do push it with me, you know, I don't know. I, 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 that was, it's like, such a, a, it, it's like a Sopranos thing. You got to understand, like when you're doing stuff like helping out do the satanic temple, you're making attacks on Christian, you know, big institutions in the country. Uh, you tell someone you got a weakness, it sets you up to be hurt. You know, like Tony Soprano was like that. Let anyone knows I got a weakness. They come and get me. Well, that seems uh -huh. to be true. That's human nature. Uh -huh. And so letting people know I had a weakness, trying to normalize this did create problems. But uh -huh. I think artists have to take the lumps a lot of time to normalize things. You know, we have to well, also, also too. I feel like for, for your art, especially, or your mentality and correct me if I'm wrong, especially in the nineties, I felt like you, you saw it as you have to create the problem in order to get the discussion to even come into yeah. becoming a discussion. It's like, you have to put it out there yeah. because there was one. So there was one artist. That I love wrote, how you said that you have to create the problem to end the problem or something. Like something. Yeah. So like for me, when I had my ego death, I had to question, well, why is it, for example, with my relationships, I can't hold down a proper relationship. So then I started questioning and I realized that I was the problem. So if I'm the problem, then that means I have to find the solution because I created the problem through my own way of reacting to things in life. So like for, so with you and how you put yourself out there in art, one thing I had loved was you, you stuck up for an artist in the nineties. I forget the young man's name, but he was from Florida. He got arrested, I believe. Right. And you were helping him when, when it comes to like the legal side of it, publishing his book. And you basically said, you, we have to put out the world is a dark place. We have to put it out there and expose it for people to see, because, you know, through that, it's just, we're sheltering everybody. Yeah. Know, really, it's, it's weird. That, that was a, that was a time that this person was being charged with obscenity charges. And I took it, I championed his work and his art. Mm -hmm. And I, that was the same, you know, right. I, I said, you know, I remember there was a printing place. I, I, you know, they were printing a book and collating it. And I'm like, is it ready? It's supposed to be due today. And like, well, we don't have it ready today. And I go, why? And they go, all the people that were collating, the ladies started crying and they left work. They left work. They won't collate your book. So I had to go in there and with my friends and we had to collate it because no one would wow. collate because it, it was so, so it was really that shocking at that time for, for people to see. Yeah. People would leave crying. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We had police stop, you know, Oh yeah. It was fucking heavy, dude. Fucking. Wow. I remember making photocopies of it. In Wicker Park on a copy machine, a cop comes in there, looks what looks at what I'm photocopying and starts yeah. asking me questions about it. What's this? Really? You know, like, this is fucked up, dude. And I, yeah, and he's like, you know, he started asking, I'm like, I work for Oprah Winfrey. I work for Oprah. This is for her show. She's having a, a mentally ill person on her show. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and the guy looks at me and then he walks away. So that's why I, I, I was, I'm from Chicago like, <laughs> in Texas. We got arrested. We we're going to get arrested for these books. And I'm like, I'm with Oprah fucking Winfrey. You got that? <laughs> when, when I, when I fucking call her, those lawyers going to drop down on your fucking head guy. So let me call her, get me to the phone. Then they let you go. When you say Oprah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I something I would have done as a kid. There's something to try and get out of the situation and still be able to do what you got. Cause I grew up in the punk scene. I grew up doing yeah, this, man. This shit and just trying to, uh, put a debt into society in some way or the other so I could be heard because all all people our age when we're young we feel like the world doesn't want to hear us so we're just angsty and full of fucking right. hyperness and and that's funny that's why I told that kid the other day I go listen dude quit acting like a fucking dick I get it you don't give a f- you hate old people resources are wasted on us you want all of my shit and you want me to get out of your way so you can move forward as fast as you can Mm-hmm. I get it. The old people suck. They're in your way. Right. And he's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, right. but I'm not leaving anywhere. I'm trying to help you, dude. Like, but, but if it comes down to it, I'm going to fucking have to hurt you. I'll, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll cripple you up and slow you down to be at my speed. So mm-hmm. if we're competing, you got to think, how did I make it this far? <laughs> you know, do you really want, you know, I know you are looking to see the old thing, but old people made it this far for a reason. So why the almanac? What, what, what is it about the almanac, the satanic almanac that made you want to put it out? Well, the satanic almanac is just like taking control away from the satanic temple and other people. It's about just putting a hashtag online saying uh, satanic almanac 2022. And everyone's on there and able to have a discussion about it. And it just uh-huh. is a discussion and it's a philosophy. And we get together and talk about these things. Uh-huh. And, and that's that's exciting. That's what uh-huh. Satanism should be. That's uh-huh. what it is. It's a it's a conversation. It's a philosophy. It's not a religion. It's not something to follow. It's not something to abide by. Uh-huh. You know, it, it's something to read and and use as you will. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've, I've always I'm, I I I tend to play devil's advocate. So I'm always the type of person I'd rather hear both sides of the story, find the pros and cons and things, and just take it from there. So like a lot of I was raised Catholic. I have my own belief or faith or whatever you want to call it. But at the same time, I'm always interested in having conversations, whether it be theological, philosophical, um, realism versus fantasy. You know, I'm always willing to just hear what people have to say. And this is, I feel like, is necessary. Like, I would love if you ever did decide to, like, have a sit down with someone who maybe is a born again Christian and then a person who is um, um, a Satanist sit down and talk and just find just like find out like the thing is is like you have to find the people that are willing to be unbiased and not i've done un- that yeah holy hotties ex porn stars turn to christ and uh, <laughs> i sit down and talk with them them all the time I, i've uh-huh. talked to the, 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 the jesuit priest of DePaul university so those sit downs are possible hey, i would love to see this it's a thing i would love to to try and you know, one person who was, and a lot of people don't like him because of the whole Proud Boys thing. And yeah, that shit was stupid, but I'm also the type of person I'll give everybody a listen to. But if, um, Gavin McGinnis from Vice used to have this show, I don't know if he still has it now, where he has people from different spectrums of ideology sit down and actually have a discussion and talk and let their opinions fly out and not feel like they have to be censored. And maybe if it, try and be civil about it in some way. But like, I think that needs to be more common in today's society. Like people need to meet up at coffee shops and talk about shit. I agree. I agree. It, it, we, you, you should encourage that more often. That's what you're doing with this. Yeah. I don't know if it's needed. I think like Gavin McGinnis is already doing that. You're doing mm-hmm. it. We, I have outlets to talk and say whatever I want. Like no one's uh-huh. stopping me from saying awful things. Uh-huh. Uh, biased things. No one. Just Twitter says they don't want it on their thing. That's mm-hmm. their business. I mean, yeah, I don't see how people can't understand that, especially conservatives. Like they're, you know, like that's what. But that's why I had. That. That's why it's I had the- mentioned earlier. I've noticed that, and a lot of people will tell you they've noticed that when it comes to the political ideologies, conservatives are more now for uh, free speech, whatever you want to call it. They're very against censorship, and now that we, some people, not some people, a lot of people think that the left now is becoming the the well, ones that want to shut down you for speaking what you want to speak, whether it be anti-vax, for example, or you're anti this, or maybe think you think this way. Con- conceptually, that's that's probably not the best because uh, conceptually, politically correct conversation 
is 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 whoever's the politician in charge. Mm-hmm. So it's like because they're you know everyone thinks they're politically correct. I'm mm-hmm. a Republican. Let's say I'm not. I'm a Democrat running for office. I'm politically correct. The Republicans think they're politically correct. So they. Mm-hmm. The Republicans are sitting there talking about we don't want that said. This is wrong. They're, they're having the same debate that the left wing is. I don't see it as a left wing thing. Mm-hmm. I see a lot of people not willing to change based on people saying, hey, that hurt my feelings. Mm-hmm. Hey, that's not cool. Hey, I go to college, like college safe rooms. When I th- heard about it, it's it sounded silly. But when I looked into it and researched, I was like, that's perfectly acceptable. Like, if someone's going to school, I don't want to treat everyone like everyone else. I think that it's torn our society apart. We're individuals mm-hmm. and we should be encouraged to be the best people we can be and learn how we learn. Mm-hmm. But um, oh, what the fuck was I talking about? Now? Fuck. With the ideology of political and then uh, political correctness, schools. I, I see what you're saying because, um, you know, Telling certain people you could tell they need to strap up their boots and 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 get your shit done sort of thing. And there's some people you have to sort of be like a little more temperament and be like, hey, I understand what's going on. A lot of people think differently. A lot of people feel differently. And you can't just act the same way to everybody and think that everyone's going to. What I'm saying is I don't I don't. I don't see the Republicans being any different than the Democrats in a lot of ways. Oh, no, they're both the same. From, right. From, but, 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 but I, I look completely at, agree with that. Noam Chomsky, one of the smartest men in the world. When you look at the, the smartest people in the world, when you ask them who ought to vote, Noam uh-huh. Chomsky will say, like, our government sucks. Two party system sucks. You know, he could agree they're basically the same party. But when you vote against Democrats, you vote against poor people mm-hmm. because that's where the democratic politics are. They, and when Democrats are in office, people get more food stamps, people get more help. There's more resources flying around than when Republicans are more rich people get, you know, th- those, those tax breaks. So it's just like one of those things, like, in, in, I agree with you, but as far as interests go, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. I'm listening. Oh, oh shit. What the fuck? I'm sorry. I hit a button and everything started. It's always, I'm right here. Um, I just don't, I don't see a comparison in the two. I just like, I, like for me, I'm looking into a hundred years into the future. Like, how do we, how do we, how, how do we vision a world without cars? How do we start letting robots fucking do some of this shit work? And, and how do we stop working five days a week? How do we get a three day work week? Like how, you can't raise a family with no time off working five days a week one day for rest, one day to get ready for work for the next five days. And people are asking what's wrong with the youth, all this kind of stuff. It seems like obvious questions, obvious answers. Like we work too much. We don't have health care, you know, kind of shit like that. So it's like, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Like politics is playing there. There's a a rotten game. You got to play. You got to negotiate. You got to, you got to sell people out to get, get a little bit for someone. You got to sell someone out. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not very anti-government I'm not libertarian um, at one point I thought uh, maybe I am a centrist but then I started hating government again um, I'm very anti-corporation and, it, and I was talking to my friend John about this the irony is that you have these like YouTube channels that let's say right wing channels that are against censorship like uh, private companies like Twitter they're against um Apple, for example, using cheap labor, but at the same time, we have to use these things in order to communicate. That's why I had said earlier, I don't think a lot of people are utilizing the social media correctly because it can be attainable where we can have good social media. Um, But at the same time, you know, it's just an irony that we have to use these things. And even if you don't want to support Amazon, for example, you know, I was telling my friend, John, you don't know what Jeff Bezos has his, his hands in other sort of entities out there in business wise. Like, how do you know this pen I'm holding wasn't made from some company that he's invested in? So we still have to use these things, even though we don't want to. And it's, it's like, it makes me think of the movie Terminator. We have to fight the machines at one point because it's going to get like that. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I think like part of our history is like always is we look at, and the end is near the end is here. 
Part of it is we're always afraid of the new technology, the car, the gu- any, the light. It's all witchcraft, and all, but it all has bettered our life. Uh, you know, all of the tech and internet has bettered our life. We have more conversation now, not less. We have more free speech, not less. We have more of everything because of the internet, not less. We're more connected, not mm-hmm. less. But people will say, oh, man, we don't have free speech. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? We, we got more free speech than we've ever had. Mm-hmm. That's 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 just not true. I, I not. think people are, are not freeing themselves mentally to right. have the confidence to say what they want to say because they, that, they're scared of the repercussion. But that's a definite that's that's like uh, I would say normalizing mental health care, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that, getting away from anxiety. But mm-hmm. a lot of times when I hear people talking about problems. They're talking about today, but these conversations that we're having are actually resolving the problems. So you talking about that and these kids saying, no, we got to get rid of free speech. We got to, we got to know you can't be a Nazi and have free speech, but so they're trying to redefine things. And and that this conversation is how that happens. And then five years down the road, Mm -hmm. the next thing, you know, drunk driving is happening, you know, like, like drunk driving is a great example. It just became socially unacceptable to drink and drive, but it was socially acceptable and fun. At some point we were like, yeah, we fucked up and drove home. Mm -hmm. And then it, then it all turned. And then it became socially unacceptable. Then it became an industry, you know, <laughs> roadblocks. Mm-hmm. Then it became infringements of rights. Mm-hmm. Then it became, now we're going to have helmet laws. Now we're going to have seatbelt laws. So all these things started triggering at the same time. And it was the same moment that we're having now. Same mm-hmm. fucking thing. I'm a child watching everyone. I'm not wearing a fucking helmet. I'm not wearing a fucking seatbelt. I'm not fucking. It was the same fucking thing. Like, it's the same fucking argument. It's like, it's nutso. It's nutso to me. You know, like it's it's not so to me that people are like anti-vax, let's say. And I'm not saying the choice to put something in your arm or not, that's fine. But to actually go out there and be anti what our society's wrapped in without moving to the woods and giving up on it all is totally offensive to me. Like then pack up your bags, move to the woods and start See, fishing. And, and I had up. I had an argument with a buddy of mine who's um uh, very pro anarchy. He's in the, uh, the idea of anarchy, and I'm just like Okay, well, you know, which one though? Anti-technology. There's so many. You know, he's, so, he's, many- so he's he's anti-capitalistic. Anno and uh, anno. I don't know what it is. He's very. Right. He doesn't believe in um, capitalism. He'd rather have these the 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 democratic socialistic sort of world that he envisions. You know? I agree with him. Um, very anti-private. Um, but at the same time, too, I, I have arguments with him in a good way. We're still friends. I still love him to death. Um, to me, that I feel like then you're just giving more power to, to the, the ones that already have been putting these strongholds on us as the government. But anyway, so but I've had conversations with him where I'm just like, well, why don't you then, if this is something you're, you don't want to be part of this capitalistic society and you don't want to deal with money anymore, why don't you just save your money? and move out in the woods and start just building a community of your own. Well, you, you, I need, it's always an excuse. Well, well I, don't, I would need to buy land. I said, then buy the land. Well, I would but, need to, I would need to uh, learn how to do things. I said, then take your time and learn these things. But that's because- like saying, that's like saying to a lion, you don't like the cage, get out of the cage, quit using the cage. It's, it's like, it's like when people argue with Anne Rand, they always like, well, Anne Rand used the system. She used government assistance when she was dying. She used this. I'm like, yeah, but that's not she didn't say she was against using it. She was said she's against it being used mm-hmm. like in a, in a in a in a broad way like that. But she's not. It's like she's in the system as it is. Of course, she's going to use indoor plumbing. She could be against indoor plumbing mm-hmm. as well. But there's no outdoor plumbing anymore. So she's got to use the indoor plumbing and she's still mm-hmm. against it. I don't know how. You know, so then, so then, what, what, what would lead a person to the point to say, "Well, fuck it, I'm so tired of indoor plumbing. I'm just going to make that outdoor plumbing. I'm going to, I'm going to strap up and do the work." You read about the Unabomber. He did that. Yeah, he got so, sick <laughs> you know? of it. so, so he left. He went to the middle of the woods. I myself lived on a beach for two years. Like I got sick of it and lived on a beach and turned my back to all of it and was eating straight off a farm and all that kind of shit. And it was like, um. <laughs> it was it was it, it is it is so incredibly hard and it takes your whole fucking day to live 
So our conveniences that we have, I appreciate. You know, I do. I don't like capitalism as it stands because I think, like you could say, your friend's against capitalism, but what kind of capitalism? My friend's an anarchist, but which one? Like, and the capitalist society we have now, I've already showed you at the beginning of the show, I have done successful things over and over again. Where's my money? Where's my fucking money? The, re- okay, the, so then- the soda company was my realty ticket. Like the soda company was my realty ticket out. Where is my money from that? In a capitalist society, I should be able to be as successful as the rich person that steals my shit over and over again. But I'm not. Poor people aren't able to climb that ladder. It's very rare. And if they if they are, they're used as a token, as a look at this poor white trash. He's rich. Look at so, look at Trump. So then, so then with that, with um, so I, I had told him. The, the person I had told him, listen, I, the common ground that we could both realize, because it's not the capital list as a whole. We are in a mixed economy where the government does have say on how. Um, I have to take off my headphones because. I, can you hear me? I can. Okay. I can hear you. Okay, so, um, so we live in a mixed economy. The government regulates how businesses are going to essentially run. Um, I told him we, we need to agree that corporate. Greed is what's the problem. And the reason why that's the problem is because corporate greed uses that money to buy out these politicians to get things the way they wanted, whether it be cheaper labor laws or um, tax cuts, taps, tax loopholes and whatnot. So I'm I'm looking at him like, well, then I'm, I've, I said it earlier. I don't believe you could change the world as a whole. You can only change yourself and then work on your community. I, I, it has to start from a community aspect, but then you have the individuals, like there's some people that live in, within your community that don't want that. So you, how do you go about it? Bless you. How do you go about it where like you want to try and change with a bunch of people, but then you're still going to have resistance. Do you ignore the resistance? Do you kick it out? Do you let you it ask go? your philosophy? Yeah. You know, well, philosophy will answer that one. Some people will say, well, you go in there and you kill them. Mm-hmm. You destroy, you crush their skulls until they yeah. agree, until they're afraid. Well, For me, I don't care. I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm like going to be like, okay, I did the best. Let's try to show them that this works. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to waste my time trying to convince you. I'm going to show you it works. Or, you know, you, basically, I like the idea of trying to sell enough people on your idea that it wins and it's the laws. I think it's how you look at things. Like for me, if I were a 20 something or even your age or even my age, I, I think about now I could, I mean, I could, I probably have another 50 years in me. Ha <laughs> ha. But, uh, yeah. Um, don't go anywhere just yet, Shane. We still right. need, to, but I think, I think you should be trying to build a, fil- a, a, a political philosophy that hasn't been written yet. Yeah. You know, that's what we need. We can talk about communism, socialism, c- capitalism, but we need something that is the word blog podcast mm-hmm. we need a fucking word that hasn't been made mm-hmm. and a system that's sort of like well when you tell me about your political th- theory that sounds like communism oh no well here's this oh okay and it's like something we haven't it's the for me i feel like it's a why don't we mesh the best of all the worlds mm-hmm. like that seems to work that doesn't this works that the like they say socialized uh fire department socialized sounds good i like firemen i like mm-hmm. fires being put out when they're burning sounds good <laughs> yeah. Anyway, no, but the, the, the thing too is with with censorship too. It's it nowadays a lot of people feel like you can't say certain things on YouTube without getting flagged by YouTube themselves. You can't say certain things on Twitter, or you're you know you're gonna get fu- you know you're gonna get fucking banned. And right, and so when I was a kid, you couldn't wear certain T-shirts into the airport. Yeah, uh, that is, really. That's yeah, it. They, I'm not oh, surprised yeah. though. The '90s were. Uh, I think the '90s was definitely where a lot of things was like really opened up of shock value. You had the '80s, but in the '50s, you couldn't you couldn't drive into the South as a rock and roll band. Mm-hmm. That's true. So we've always had these issues. They're just different. They fr- they're framed different. They look different. Or now that we're all connected, they look a lot larger than they are. Mm-hmm. Or we're seeing things. Like, like for my generation, I have one foot in a different era and, and one foot in this new era. So I know Alan Moore spoke about how the internet's going to give us so much information. We're going to and vaporize because we're getting hit with so much information from every corner of the globe. And we're not used to no animals used to that. We're used to just like dealing with our forest, like right here. Oh, there's a fire. We can see it. We can smell it. This is tragedy. 
but we don't know about the hundred thousand fires that are always burning around the globe. Mm-hmm. And now that we do, we're freaking out. And some say if you limit yourself, you're you actually you expand more mentally if you limit your resources. So, for example, um, I believe that. Like a per like if I'm like as an artist for yourself, um, some people just use a pen and a paper. And that's that's their only medium or f- medium format that they use, but they're able to come up with some amazing fucking art with just a pen. Yeah. Shading and whatnot. I feel like, you know, that's why I we I, I keep saying I, the we don't utilize this enough because everything is within our fingertips. We could look up anything. I could look up your name right now and find out information about you, but at the same time, it's so much information that we're not processing it correctly or see, I, I think i think i think you know like and this is where you're at that age you see that stuff i i you sound like me at that age exactly we're not doing we're not doing enough and i see it today and i'm like i i think people are doing that and i think you're you're right and you're wrong i think there's people doing just what you're saying using it wrong and there's plenty of people using it right yeah like i'm i'm blown away by the whole how things are moving and i'm i do you think it's moving too fast? Do you think it's moving too slow? Is it going at a... Oh, no, I love it. We're in a moment of chaos that no one can deny. Like, this is the chaos poor people feel every fucking day. Uh-huh. So it's like, please, I want you all to feel this, motherfuckers. I want you all to feel the I don't know what's going to happen to me every fucking day anxiety, bitch. Like, yeah, this is cool. I sort of feel like that, too, in a way I don't where I'm just like, I'm ready for the system to crash already. Just fucking let the federal, let the market crash and just let's finally get to the point where we're just like because you have to destroy destroy to create so if if the system is destroyed we're gonna have to come up with something better obviously well well you don't know if it'll be better right away it might be right, exactly it's gonna take how, how bad can it get before it gets better is what we might be seeing here and, I think and that- they say everybody's bottom is different so some people could fucking take this and be like yeah let's do it some people fucking god forbid unfortunately end it all we got a lot of poor people in this country that pull their teeth with pliers. Mm-hmm. That's like a normal time. So yeah. when they bring that pain to Main Street, it's definitely a different environment. That's for sure. Yeah, it's um, interesting seeing because here in Macon, you. It, but it then too, a lot of people get so desensitized. Uh, they get so desensitized by it because here in Macon, you're walking down a street and you're seeing these yuppie. Uh, Southern people with their fucking nice uh, vests and their nice Patagonia hats and shit like that. And then on the benches, you see the homeless people just piled up, hanging out together. It's just a weird time to see the two spectrums together in one area. But it you can, it still feels the opposite. There, it doesn't feel like they're together, if you get what I'm trying to say. like um, You can really tell the difference economically. Of how people are. Here. Oh yeah, after after nine eleven, it was interesting when when September, you know, nine eleven, the buildings dropped. I remember going out for an anniversary dinner like ten days later, and and rich people were really upset. Mm-hmm. Like they were drunk, they were laying in the gutter. It was really bad. They were fighting. We're like, you know, we went to a rich area to have a dinner, and and it was like nine eleven didn't bother anyone that was poor because our economy does. We don't have an economy. Yeah. You know? So it's like. We're like, yeah, whatever. This is just another fucking day of pliers for the teeth. <laughs> and, and all these poor rich people that were devastated. So when you're saying we all have a different bottom, that's the truth. Mm-hmm. And revolutionaries say you have to get, you have to affect the poor, the, the rich person's bottom. Mm-hmm. And by doing that, what you need is rich people's children to join the revolution and stand in the front. And once the rich kids join the revolution, everything changes. But the, the, the thing is, are they doing it for the right intentions or is it just for some what these kids call these days clout? Who cares? Well, <laughs> Who cares? As, long, as long as we have dental care. <laughs> True. So True. make it cool. I, I mean, make it may, I, so mo- making a movement like Me Too movement or something cool is one thing. Making a religion cool so you can have followers in the army is not cool. Mm-hmm. So, see, I, I, I think the only place we can have unity and magic and stuff like that isn't in, with, within organizations, but within moments like, holy shit, this is intense. There's so there's more women have left their house and are in the streets for me too, but than ever happened. This is a global protest. That was an intense piece of magic. 
And so for me, seeing that kind of stuff, that's what I hope for when you see it over in Asia, when a dictator won't leave office, how the streets fill. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful to me. And that's, what we, that's what we have to fit. For me, I got to figure out how can we get that done? How can I make a zine that talks about general strike and give it to poor people that are like, what is a general strike? So they understand what it even is. It's hard because it, 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 with today's technology, everything is so instant. Everything goes quickly. So like, look at Hong Kong. I had it was a mixture of people who didn't even know that people were protesting in Hong Kong against the yeah. Chinese government. And then there's people who were so into it and we're talking about it 24 seven. And then the people in the middle were just like, uh, click. Well, when you observe TV. when you observe this stuff, do you, you, you observe problems, but do you observe solutions or do you see the pros and the cons when you observe this stuff? I see do the pros see and the like cons because the pro is, yes, people are talking about it and it's getting coverage. But then the con is, it's just like. It, it, so much happens and goes on in the world right now as we speak there's someone just had a baby right now as we're speaking someone just died so I it's think, just i think part of the pain of evolution or our life is that we plant seeds that we're not going to see mm -hmm. and only our grandchildren will see them so mm -hmm. we're sort of your life is a love note to someone in the future or hate note but you're not going to be able to see them read it and that's what bothers us because we're going to die. And but you had mentioned earlier that on. we want everything now, though. That's one of the good things about our, our evolution. Now we want it now. We want change now. And right. we're pushing it and pushing it. But, but a lot of times we're not going to see that. You know, we're not going to see it for generations mm -hmm. and we probably won't see it. So for me, growing up and watching in Chicago, in the gay neighborhoods, you'd be there and you'd, you'd hear something called fag bashing which they come into the gay neighborhoods and beat people up with ball bats. And then the gay community started wearing pink triangles mm -hmm. and they'd run out of alleys and beat the shit out of the fag bashes. And it was a whole thing, but never in my life. And I have an excellent imagination. Could I imagine that gay marriage would be happening mm -hmm. and be accepted and hasn't been pulled down by the Republicans? No one's saying a fucking word about it. Mm -hmm. How the fuck did that happen in my lifetime? Well, it happened because five generations before I was born, gay people were dying, pushing things forward. And I think that's the unfortunate part of our existence is what are you doing to plant seeds for those grandchildren? Or, and that's what I think when I do stuff, is this in vain? Should I just go eat a chocolate bar and masturbate? Mm -hmm. Should I get my nipples tickled? Or should I do this hard work that's going to put the seed down for the future? Well, I'm going to put the seed down because how do I know? I don't know. Maybe I fucking reincarnate. Maybe I'm going to come back and I won't feel so much pain. That'd be a good thing. So I'm going to wrap this up pretty soon, but I have a quick question. Then what do you, for, uh, this is every question I'm going to be asking people, what to the person that ends up watching this video and hopefully they have the attention span enough to <laughs> listen to the whole thing and not just try and take clips and whatever. Um, what advice do you have for anybody out there that's listening, maybe an artist or someone looking into getting into art or who feels lost from your own experience? That's a real hard one because things are so different. I would say like going back to being able to ask for help, mm -hmm. say, I need help. I want to do this. Get rid of all the fear. You know, art doesn't have, art is about being courageous. If you can't be courageous, get the fuck out and call yourself a crafter. Or call yourself something else, but don't step into the big boy shoes, the big person shoes of, of art, you know, because we're honest to the point of hurting ourselves sometimes. Like we're honest, we put stuff out. We, you know, presently, some people were complaining about stuff I did in the past. And I was like, yeah, I'm not a politician. I don't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. How's that? I'm not running for office anytime soon. So who I was me well, it hurt my feelings. Yeah, yeah, I meant to. I meant to hurt your fucking feelings with my art. That's yeah. right. Glad I did it. Glad you saw it. And I get the fuck out. I'm yeah. not running for office, but they don't, they don't comprehend that. Cause you, I think that's something a new generation, like everyone's looking for a cloud or voting or whatever. I just, I, I just would say, be, you know, that just search for honesty, break your fucking back. Just keep, you know, search for answers. That's what it's about. It's not, it's about, I don't know that that's what I would, I communicate out of need. I use art as a communication tool. So I would say poor people, there's difference. Don't be so afraid of your fucking self and quit telling people that you don't listen to anyone telling you can't make a soda pop company, make a soda pop company and throw a bottle through that person's window. <laughs> gotcha. You know, just do that. And rich people. If you have a voice, use it for poor people. 
Like if you're a person who got money to go to art school and shit like that, quit fucking taking gigs from the fucking graph artist, quit riffing off of our shit, our talent, and just take your art degree and go teach kids in the ghetto to make fucking art. But quit trying to be us. You ain't. You don't need art to communicate. You've got this, this paper that gets you everywhere and gets you money and gets you dental insurance. you got a college degree. Get the fuck out of here. You know, go, 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 go. <laughs> That's my advice. Mm-hmm. Or do something for poor people, but quit acting like you're, you need art to create. I think art is primal. It's from people who don't know how to, you know, ha, ha, you know, it's, it, that's where it's at. It's, it's, it's child. It's a child, child, children use art to create. And so do people that have a hard time with words or they don't have a hard time with words, but they communicate better with abstracts. I don't know, you know, do the best you can to, to be courageous. It's hard. It's hard when you be honest because people don't like honesty. Yeah. Well, there's one artist out there. I don't know if you heard of him, Hugh Lee Crowley. I don't know if you ever seen this guy. He he um so he's an artist that created this character who calls himself um the legend. He has a saying called legend shit. And uh it's from what I've gathered, it's sort of like an Andy Kaufman. So he became he took his art that he of this painting of this one guy that kind of looks like a mix of Gigi Allen. And some fucking cracked out uh, uh, divorcee dad. And he actually became the character. So now he dresses up as Hughley Crowley. And he goes out to the streets of New York and just starts making videos. And it's gotten to the point. I've, I've talked to him and I've been able to communicate with him um, via Instagram. And it's he he's smart. I'll give this him credit. He actually got legend shit trademark. So now he, he, people can't say it without his permission. I hope he doesn't come down on me for it. But like I just mentioned the story, but that's just amazing how as an artist for him, he's found his little niche in order to put a dent in society and make a loud noise. But I, I also give him credit for now he's seeing the opportunity when it comes to using it to, I guess, make money and further what he's trying to say because he uses shock value. Like, yeah, you know, he I do. I used to do it. Prosthetic tits that he wears under his costume and he's running around New York City screaming his head off and reciting Creed lyrics. Oh, I love that kind of stuff. My favorite performance artist in New York is Crackhead Barney. Crackhead Barney. He, I think he wonderful. does stuff with, uh, with her as well. She's just the best. She's so, uh, so fucking outrageous. I love that shit. That's what like, like, you know, talking about giving advice to artists and stuff. I don't know. Let's make art. That's mm. uh, like, li- I don't know. So what, what, at, at what point though, for as for, from, from you, your point of view as an artist that's been in it for so long, let's say Huey Crowley, for example, has now become the piece of artwork that he created in his head. Do you think that's something that's lasting or how would he go about, would you suggest if he, cause I'm sure he would not give a shit whether what your opinion is, but how would you go about it? Do you think that's something that's lasting or. Well, it just depends on what his goals are. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot yeah, of people, don't, they feel like lucky. They got a character and they're like, Hey, I got a character. I'm staying in this character. I got game. I'm making some money and this is going to take me to the end of my late days. And you know, that's fine. I'm not into that. You know, for me, that's exactly what happened to me. Like I felt when, before I did that one piece that you spoke about the, the, the between my feet piece, I started to become a character of a character of myself uh-huh. as a Satanist, all this stuff. That's why I was like, yeah, wearing all black is like a work uniform. That's what fucking waiters wear. Fucking stupid. You know, and then I started critiquing it. Like, you know, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm not anyway, yeah. I, I don't want to be a character of myself, a character of myself. And, uh, well, I've noticed but how also, it's- but also Satanism sticks. So it's like I do rituals. I did a ritual for the presidency. I'm mm-hmm. supposed to be going to Europe um, this year and touring with the band Cripple Black Phoenix. Okay, doing rituals and shit like that. So, you know, it that stuff is also sticks. But I, I consider that a part of an art philosophy. That's art. It's performance art. You know, so it's still. I can see how you added some flair to your to yourself, whether it be your sweatshirt that you're wearing right now, or even some of the stuff that you did from the the monkey fashion um, house, where um, you have the pentagrams that have bling 
and it, it sprinkles. It's it's I, that's what I have because I'm thinking. I was thinking at the time, I was like, I wonder what Shane's going to do, because, you know, you seem to have been kind of quiet online when it comes to releasing stuff. You were still selling patches and whatnot, but then you started coming out with this whole new thing. Now you're doing custom, not custom, but you're you're revamping old material and turning it into jackets and yeah, bags yeah. and whatnot. And it's just, it's interesting seeing that how you're moving forward now. I love fabric art. Mm-hmm. And I fell in love with that, like, you know, when I started going to counseling and I just love it. And I like using, I like making things that are functional. Sculpting is a rich man's game, a rich person's game. Cause you have to have places to put your sculptures, you know, they break you. It's a rich person game. So sculpting, I love, but I also, I like making jackets, something someone can wear out of the house. It's functional. So I, I don't know. I like all that shit. It ties in with magic. I'm making a bunch of ponchos like magic ponchos or something. And I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I, I'm not appropriating culture, you know, for, for that I'm making it my own. There are so many, I use poncho cause I like this, how it sounds, but mm-hmm. there are so many of the similar ponch- blankets that go over a head with the whole, you know, there's so many, every culture has something like that, mm-hmm. which is amazing to me, these coverings. So at some point, shit, if I stay, if I can stabilize next year, I would love to do an art show of all these coverings. Cause then I do like ponchos. Mm-hmm. But make it goth, make it satanic. And I do like, there's an Alaskan form of poncho, but it's a different name. So uh-huh. I would do all these forms of coverings, of comfort, yeah. of, of warmth, yeah. of healing. See, it goes into that. That's what I see it anyway. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Because you, you, it's some interesting stuff. Like you got the, uh, the just do it and you turn the fucking knife into the logo. Like I've showed people that and they're just like, what? That's so fucking... That's sick, but it's just, it's, um, I have for me as a, a person who appreciates what you do, I have high hopes for what you're going to do in the future from just what I've, I'm, I'm enjoying, um, what I'm seeing because it's definitely something, especially like the pink, for example, it's just, it's just something so out there. And it's just like, a, I could see how to a person from the nineties, because hip hop was such a big thing in the '90s, I'm sure in Chicago it was just like in New Jersey. So I can I, I can see it kind of flowing into what you're doing now, where you're adding that flair and those colors and just different things yeah. while trying to implement your philosophy or your thoughts. Yeah, and here's and the thing is, I'm bringing that that concept back when when I use that bling. It's back then, kids. It was just all street art. So mm-hmm. hip hop, heavy metal, punk rock. Graffiti was all the same fucking thing. Mm-hmm. It was all poor people making really fucking shitty stuff that no one paid attention to. Mm-hmm. You know, so we all grew out of that. All that stuff grew at the same time. It it got sectioned off and co-opted and sold to marketed and, and turned into something else. But it was just one big urban, all that stuff was urban move uh street art and then it you know heavy metal and all this stuff started to hit. see that's why i wanted to interview you because i think like I, more people younger generation that are into what you've done i had mentioned in the instagram a message uh mr pickles for example that show like that shit that you saw in the 90s even up to like when crumb was around you know you 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 see these types of artworks where it was very thought provocative and gritty and now it's become an aesthetic. I just want to tell the youth of today, like, show some fucking respect to your elders. Like, you're you're amongst a person that pushed and put themselves in situations where you're getting questioned by cops. You're on TV trying to defend an artist from Florida for wanting to express how they feel. And now it's on, you know, we wear it every day, you know. So fucking show <laughs> some respect to your elders, you assholes. I, I like, I, I'll take that. I'll take it. You know, it's it because it's unfortunate. The trailblazers usually die unappreciated. Mm-hmm. And, and and then when they die, they get appreciated. And mm-hmm. a lot of people say, oh, you're an artist, people in business, Hollywood, stuff like that. If I go out to, you know, I've been, you know, they've, I've been asked to go do something or help pitch a movie or something like that. Mm-hmm. So I go out there and like my agent will say, oh, you're the artist that you're the kind of artist that makes a lot of money when they're dead. Because, and I go, yeah, but why is it? She goes, oh, the main reason that works is because you're uncontrollable. And a dead artist is controllable. We can make any story we want then. But if you're that's, alive, you're going to complain. That's what, 
one of my favorite stand-up comedians, Patrice O'Neill, that's what it was for him. He had that very fuck you attitude in his career when he was alive, where he didn't want to sell out to Hollywood and the media. So he was more like, I'm just going to be myself and you either take it or leave it. And I know that no one's going to give a shit about me now. And come to find out, it's been a few years since he's passed. His name is now slowly getting up there in the comedy world again, where it's just like, wow, he was one of the greats. And now he's getting yeah. the recognition that he... But it doesn't matter. Died. It doesn't yeah. matter. Because he's I'm dead. Happy people are still talking about him. That's yeah, what but, you, but I'm saying, think about, think about justice. It doesn't matter if someone talks about me in a good way when I'm dead. They're talking about you. I, I get, it doesn't matter. I'm dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'm getting like, for me, when I watch, I see these trailblazers. I'm like, like I wrote a Twitter to Jay Z and stuff. I'm like, how in the fuck are you letting all these old hip hop artists die without opening up a funeral or, or open up a, uh, old folks home for hip hop artists. You got a <laughs> dollars, bitch. Uh -huh. Time to fucking throw it on and fucking do something for the people who blaze the trails for you and with you. Mm -hmm. He's got so much money. He could dole out to the whole community. Yeah, but he's got that mentality of he wants to hold on to that money. So he's more of like, yeah, he wrote well, that song, the, the story of OJ Simpson. That's basically him talking about like why he is the way he is, is money and investments. He wants to, he buys art and lets it sit. And I get that. There's people like that, but I'm just saying, I'm going to call him out from artist to artist. Oh yeah, of course. And I'm going to say, why aren't you doing something for the people who did for you? The reason you have this is because of them. Mm -hmm. So it's time for artists that make it like a Madonna, anyone that makes it like that, start opening up some old folks home for retard for, for artists, mm -hmm. for, you know, people that need it start paying, you know, like in new Orleans, I guess musicians can get free healthcare down there because mm -hmm. music is a big part of their business. That's so good. they take care of the artists because it's part of their is, you know, that's what I think in order to have a healthy industry or, or show your love for hip hop or the art, you would want to, say, oh, this was unhealthy, but look at younger generations, 20 year old, we're, I'm setting the trends for it to be healthier for you to express yourself. Mm -hmm. Not, I don't care about yeah. expression. I'm J fucking Z bitch. Like, oh no, fucking care, dude. <clears throat> care. Give some money back to that. And I'm not saying he doesn't, he probably, you know, probably does all the day long, mm -hmm. probably paved all the roads and fucking his neighborhood. I don't know, but it's just one of those things. I think more our, our successful artists should be active in helping artists out. Yeah. Not people who die in a fire and that they can do that too. They got so much money, but, and I'm not putting those people dead in the fire down, but again, they're fucking dead. Mm -hmm. They don't feel anything like the artist that is homeless getting his foot sawed off because of diabetes. They could have been helped with a little bit of money. That's mm -hmm. all I'm saying. Sorry if I'm yammering on, but this one. No, no. I get it. It's just like, it goes back to like, the younger crowd telling the, the boomers, get the fuck out. It's our turn to make the change. And they're just like, nah, I want to stay. The motherfucking Gen X, Gen X was ignored. We, we've been ignored the whole fucking time. <laughs> and now look, next fucking election, you're going to have a fucking one of you guys in there from millennial in the fucking presidency. Probably Gen X will never, Gen X will never have a president. <laughs> <laughs> well, Shane, I'm going to wrap this up. I want to do this again. Uh, part two or a uh, catch up, but I appreciate this. Like you have no idea. This means a lot to me as a personal fan. Oh, to able to speak to you, like finally speak to you and, and talk to the person that like, I look at it's like, fuck man, you did shit in the nineties that like stuff I would have wanted to do have done, you know, in the and I'm still going, keep doing it, brother. Keep uh, doing it. Hey, lots of love, mass love to you. And I'd love to do it again. If you ever have guests, you want to go, have you know i think you're honest i really you know i would not encourage you if i didn't think your questions and your conversation and your your curiosity is genuine you're like you're not doing this for clout you like really are trying to understand things and have this come and cause a create and this is you, you're causing you're you're causing change by doing this stuff well seeing uh, that we all we both have our own mental health issues um for me I, I'm at the point where I'm tired of seeing my friends suffer. I have a lot of friends right. suffering and for lost. And if, if I don't give freely what was given to me, and that's the genuine love, the, the genuine concern, and just being someone to listen to and give suggestions and who the fuck am I, what am I doing in this world, but just existing. And I don't want to just sit here anymore, you know, complaining. I want to do something about it. So, and you are, and you know, we, I think we've been inspiring each other, this Instagram story things. Mm -hmm. I think that shit triggers people out because I know we're both losing weight. We're both doing the 
I'm starving for 30 days. Fucking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking, <laughs> fucking fasting. I'm meditating, bitch. I'm fucking gonna get so yeah. healthy. I kill people. <laughs> but my the thing is, is my 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 desire is to inspire. Like I have all these mantras that I say. My you know all these things. But at the end of the day, it's just like I just want people to talk and have conversations. Like I, I love just, it. That's it, right. It's just, it needs to happen. And whether you you you, you know. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. No, no. Whether you you agree or not, fuck it. At least you've talked to somebody and you you expressed yourself in a yeah. fashion that could be adult like and still get your point across and have those boundaries and have those you know. Yeah, yeah, respect. man. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I'm it's really true. happy to hear mental health being. You know, it's. It, I'm happy to talk about it too because it helped me out a lot. The mental health care definitely there's definitely going to be more episodes about that that i want you to come on and because i know you did the uh the light therapy oh, yeah, emdr that was good yeah so i want to really? definitely cover that in the, in the next interview and get more in depth with that because i come you i come from a place where i'm not a fan of therapists and counseling because i've been through it and i just i'm not i'm more of like i like to do things myself and figure it out and you're more of like from what i gather you enjoy the counseling so i want to hear I want people to hear different sides of how, how, what, there's not just one way to help yourself and get better. There's multiple resources out there is how do you utilize it? So I want to, I want people to talk about their experience in the medical field of like, I'll talk about my rehab experience, outpatient okay. programs and vice versa. So that's definitely something in the future I want to cover and have a whole episode about. Well, for you anytime, man, I really enjoy our conversations. I've, I've had, a, you know, I think we've been talking for a couple of years now through Instagram and I've enjoyed yeah. it. So Shane. Thank you so much, brother. You have yourself a good one. Have a good night. Go rest up and enjoy the weekend. And keep up on the weight loss. Proud of you, brother. You too. I, I had I had Indian tonight, so now I got to – tomorrow is my relaxed day of just water and, and walking. But take care of yourself. Have a good night, man.